All right, Everybody, recording okay. has started. It's shut back there, but it's still bright behind me. Excellent. We are recording. Okay. Thank you, Gary, and welcome everybody to tonight's uh, April 26th workshop meeting. Um, we tried to bring, uh, bring everybody on board virtually today. Uh, hopefully that will end soon, um, but I'm hoping that this is the, um, the final of the putting the town budget together virtually, um, but it's per the governor's executive order that we are still doing this. Um, tonight we have uh, kind of a full agenda like we saw uh, last week with the uh, budget workshop number one. Tonight we have Parks and Rec with us, social and youth services, engineering, planning, tax collector, our town clerk, as well as town assessor, townwide radio will be discussed, I think, by Mike Emmett, our finance director, uh, town manager, of course, we have Gary Evans here to talk about that. Human resources, welcome Claudia Tata. Is it Tata? Correct. Yes. Sure. Thank Claudia Tata, who's new to uh, Town of Weathersfield's uh, staff as uh, our human resource officer, and then our council. Um, all those will probably be discussed. We won't put you, Claudia, on the uh, hot seat just just yet to talk about your budget. Um, but uh, or, Gary, or will we? <laughs> <laughs> Gary I'll, Evans will be I'll, here to talk about that for us. So I give it my best shot. <laughs> great. Anna, Three after three days. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it. Um, so, with starting off with Parks and Rec, and uh, you guys typically do it together. So, Kathy Bagley and Erica Textera, I see Mary is on with us. Anybody else from Parks and Rec or Social and Youth Services as I slide over? No. no. Okay. I will open it up to uh, Kathy and then everybody has the budget book with them. So we can go line by line for uh, Parks and Rec. All set. Good evening, everyone. I think. Oh. Yep. All set. I thought what I do would be to go through the uh, budget uh, relatively quickly and highlight some things and then Please stop me at any time if you have questions at that point and be happy to go into more detail. So I'll start right up at the top with Parks and Rec with the um, full-time and part-time salaries. You'll see that there are increases there for the full-time staff due to the contracts. And I, I will draw your attention to the part-time staff line that is right under the tech assistant that um, shows um, the adopted for this year at roughly 136,000. And next year, you'll see a large increase to 293,000. And just to take a moment to explain that, in this year's budget, um, a few of our programs were cut out of the budget for this year due to COVID. And because of that, we've restored them back to this year's budget. So um, in this current budget year, we had originally um, closed Willard Pool, the playground program, and the um, therapeutic recreation program for the summer. So those have all been put back in. So that's one piece of that increase. The second piece of that increase is the minimum wage in Connecticut went up in September of 2020 to $12 an hour. And August 1st of this coming year, 21, it will go up to $13 an hour. And that truly impacts our part-time budget. So that is a big increase, but that's the reason behind it. Um, I'll move along to uh, the benefits. You've probably already heard uh, information on the benefits and the increases there. Uh, those increases um, are substantial in some areas and minimal in others with the benefits, but it's pretty, um, pretty much, I think, the same across the board. And that then brings us into our, um, pretty much our contractual items. 
And you'll notice as we go down the list that, that we have been reduced to work with the managers for the 1% cut. So going through travel training and dues, you'll see those items that were cut with the manager's notes in the column. And then going down to support services, the same thing. Um, there were um, cuts in them also. You'll notice the pesticide control went up and that's just the contractor that comes out that sprays for um, the exterminator that's out for our buildings at the Wells House. And now we go into our utilities. So you'll see that water at our parks and pools uh, and facilities has a slight increase of 2%. So you'll see the pools, the community center and out at the parks. And then you'll get to electricity, which then has a, um, a, uh, an increase of 3%, but we held the community center number the same. Uh, we think we're going to be doing well there, and we held that number the same. And natural gas, there is a 3% for facilities also. That brings us up to our rentals for facilities and equipment, and we made some cuts there. Same thing a little bit with office machinery. Our public service contrib uh, contributions, that's both the Memorial Day Parade, Camp Sunrise, which is our um, four town camp for children with special needs. And then the rear reminder ad for the senior center programs. Then you get to our repair accounts. Um, community center was cut a little bit. The Wells House held its own. We cut the supply account. Clothing stays the same. That's for our part-time staff and for uh, full-time staff for identification out in our park programs. Building materials and supplies. A lot of that is um, custodial supplies, paper goods, things of that nature. Our office supplies. And then our other supplies which um, actually was all cut. And then, um, then it gets us to our equipment, which is our, our playground safety surfacing. We pay for that for all the park playground equipment for the safety uh, surface underneath. And then there's an account there for Nature Center that helps to go towards the utilities for the Nature Center budget. Questions? Thank you. Any questions for Kathy on this? Councilman O'Connor? Yeah, yeah. Hey, Kathy, question for you. How much money did Parks and Rec save because of COVID? Because I would assume we weren't hiring part time employees. There were programs that were canceled. Um, fields didn't have to be painted and maintained the same way. So I would assume there has to be savings. Do you have anything to show for that? For this current year? Are you looking at the, this current year that we're in? Yeah. For COVID? Um, probably the, the one savings that is there is we did not open the indoor pool this season. So there'll be some savings there. Um, we did um, some of the other things, as I mentioned earlier, were already cut that we knew we were not going to offer. I don't have the maintenance for the fields in my budget. That's in physical services. Um, and then we also had some increases in our budget this year. And one example would be we're probably going to go over in our portal budget. It's the craziest thing, but for the COVID process, we put portalettes out there. We had to clean them more frequently, so that just added to the cost. So there'll be a little bit of a give and take 
we did have a lot of a lot of the sports groups opened up in um, July of this year. They didn't go in the spring of last budget year, but they opened up in July. So they literally went through July into the fall. So instead of having the spring season, like Little League went um, July, August, and then um, into the fall. So some of that happened also. So it's a little bit of a mix on both ends. Okay. Uh, oh. Councilwoman Peltier. Um, do you anticipate having a regular summer this year, you know, that's sort of back to normal? We're, we're planning on that. Um, there will be some, some limitations and some changes. So it won't, we don't think right now it will go back completely to normal. There will be some limitations on the number of children we could take in camps due to the, <clears throat> due to the indoor spaces that we have access to to be able to have the number of children. And that's through the Office of Early Childhood at the state. So those camp numbers will be restricted a bit. And the pools will still operate similar to what they what Mill Woods did last summer, which um, which is by we actually had um, different um, spaces allocated for families because we had to also watch those numbers. And so so there'll be some of those kinds of things, but our intent right now today is to um, go out and offer everything. Okay, and hopefully it won't be as restrictive as last summer. I think we're doing pretty good with the vaccinations and stuff, but um, so, um, the fees that people pay for to go to camp or to use the pools, um, do those fees pay for a large percentage of the part-time summer staff? It, it pays for a good, a good part of the programs that we do run. There are certain programs that are in the operating budget. I mentioned the playground program earlier, the therapeutic recreation program and the, uh, the pools, those um, are in the operating budget. Pretty much any other program that we run is, um, is designed to be self-sustaining. Oh, okay. Um, so I have a question, this might be more for Mike O'Neill, but um, the parks and rec revenue projections are lower this year than last year. But if we're running more programs, I would think that the revenue would be higher than you know this current fiscal year. And thank you for sending um, the you know the sort of the logic behind the revenue projections. That was very helpful. But I just that was just the one area that I didn't quite get was the parks and rec revenue projections of, of all the other ones. You know, so I didn't know if. I don't know if you have anything to, any insight into that, Kathy, or? Sure, that, a lot of that revenue is through all of our programs. It's not just, we pretty much charge for everything. And that revenue for the self-sustaining programs pays for the program to run. That's both the staff and the supplies. And also we have to, we also give money to the town general fund. So in good years, um, it's been, the program pays for itself and then we have money left over, goes right to the town general fund in that regard. Um, for the current year, we, we haven't been running that many programs. So our, our revenue is reduced this year. And we hope next year to at least get it back and start building it back up again. And probably one of the key things with our revenue is we sell a lot of pool passes in the past. And last summer we did not sell pool passes. You uh, paid on a daily basis by your spot when you came. So that was a, that was a difference. Okay. Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, um, <clears throat> Kathy, last year with all the uh, COVID restrictions, we elected to close Willard because 
from what I understood it, the physical space didn't allow for all the distancing requirements and we thought Millwoods would be a better option. Do we think that those um, requirements are gonna be lifted so that we can use Willard or should we be talking about only opening Millwoods as we did last year? Um, we're actually um, going out and working on Willard. We, we, we believe we can open that now. They've relaxed the standards a little bit for outdoors, but that gives us enough to go ahead and do Willard Pool also. Right. And then I had, uh, I know you touched on uh, portable toilets. So are we going to just have less of them? Is that what we're saying? Uh, no, what I, I was saying that for the current year during COVID, to be cautious, we cleaned them um, twice a week instead of our normal once a week. We think we're going to watch as we go through the next year, and we're still just budgeting for cleaning once a week. Okay. And then the uh, last question I had, <clears throat> the safety surfaces for the playground, are, are we talking about the mulch that they put down or is it some other material? It, it looks like mulch, but it's a specialty product that goes, uh, it looks like a wood chip, but yeah. very fine. And it goes, it's, a, it's considered a safety surfacing. You have to have so much depth to your safety surfacing. You literally have to do it every year. Okay. Thank you. That's all I had. Any other questions for Kathy? Councilman Hill. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, Kathy, the, um, could you uh, comment to the, the, the main driver for the, the big pension increase proposed? I, I'd have to refer that to Mike O'Neill. They give us, they just give us that number. Right, right, right. I, I, I assume it's just you, it, like just two new retirees or something along those lines. That's just, again, there's, there's two things happening. One is that we estimated, I estimated an 18% increase consistent with some preliminary calculations that the actuary gave us um, back in February. And on top of that, we've got retirements. So again, I'd like to use the example of IT. IT, because of a small department and only one person there a year ago who had a pension, he retired. So now there's no allocation to IT. So that, that effect is at work also. So there's the 18% plus the fact that there's departments that are zeroing out, small departments, or, or they're half. You know, they had two people. You mm -hmm. know, another good example is finance where we had, you know, two people and now we have zero. Um, so it just drives that number up in the other departments. Got it. Okay, that's helpful very, very much. Thank you. Okay, I, uh, I got a couple of questions for you, Kathy. Um, and I know, I mean, we end up going over these line by lines. So while I got it in front of me now, the showmobile last year, did we use that at all? Oh, we did not. Okay, so that three thousand dollars won't be realized for the for the current year. No, current, current year, and I take it the same. And as Mary knows, I've sat on the Memorial Day Parade Committee even before I became a councilman. That is five thousand dollars for last year, and then I think it's. 5,000 for the year before. So we haven't had the Memorial Day Parade Committee for or Memorial Day Parade for two years. So that 5,000 I would suspect from fiscal year 20 because we are in 21. We didn't have it last year and we won't have a parade this year. Will we realize a $10,000 savings uh, for both of those years? Well, the 5,000 was for, from the previous year, which you already got at the, uh, uh, that closed out last year's budget. But the, and the 5,000 that's in for this year, there will be a savings, but
but we are using some of that money for the um, the ceremony at the cemetery. Okay. But I guess my question would be the proposed FY2122 is for 5,000. That would be for next year's Memorial Day Parade. Correct. And then the actual or adopted FY21 and then the adopted FY20 of 5,000 each wasn't used. Correct. Okay, Gary, were you gonna say something? Yeah, the, the FY20 money would have been included in last year's, um, at the end of the year when we reallocate funds. That the would stuff, have left. The stuff yep. from this year, whatever is left over, same thing, it would, it would lapse. Yep, both of those lapsed. Okay. And then a question about water usage at, um, where was it? Or no, maybe it was electricity. Electricity at the community center is in your budget, not in physical services. That's correct. Uh, was Adopted FY21 of 39,849. Was that an actual as well? Maybe that's a Mike O'Neill question. And if I look to their additional. Yeah, are you talking about the current year? Current year, yes. Yeah, that's an, that's an adopted number. And um, we're watching that closely as we go through the next couple of months. to see where it's gonna end up for this year. That's why we think we just need the same amount of money next year. We feel there might be a little savings there this year. Mm -hmm. So we could lapse some money of the electricity for the community center. Very possibly. Community center electricity is very dependent on the air conditioning. That's a big um, ticket item. And we're just coming into those months now. And we have, st we have started to rent the facility out again once the governor came out with his new directives. So that'll be interesting to see how hot it is in the next couple of months. Okay. Did we run the air conditioning? I know we have to probably run, keep it at a certain temperature so that, you know, nothing happens to the facility, but did we run the air conditioner for the most part for the summer of 2020 at the community center with it closed? We probably, we did run it, probably not as cold as people might've usually wanted because there was nobody in the building. Right. But you still wanna run it to get the humidity and things out of the building. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then to piggyback off of what Mary uh, Pelletier or Councilwoman Pelletier was saying, the summer programs, and I know I'm working on it on the state level, the ARP funds and the Accelerate CT funds, um, do we know if any of that will pay for summer programs at all? Right now, we haven't gotten any information. We're working with our state association too, to, and they're kind of keeping us updated on it, but I haven't gotten anything yet that lets me know. The only thing we've heard is that it might, it might require you to run programs with stricter guidelines than we currently do, and we're not sure if that is feasible or not. So those are all things we're looking at. Okay. Right, smaller cohorts, more staff. Yeah, they have, um, they have, uh, they, um, they ask you to look at, there's a care for kids program at the state that you need to do certain things in order to get reimbursed if children come to your camp. And they changed them about three years ago and they made them much more restrictive where it was just very difficult for us to do that when we had two or three kids that were involved in getting that type of scholarship. Mm -hmm. So we have to right. wait and see what they come out with. 
if I'm not mistaken, and I think only one municipality conforms to the care for kids uh, guidelines. Yeah, yep. it, yeah, it's it's they are they're looking at it from a different perspective as child care, where whereas we're looking at it as a summer camp. Okay, and then I guess my last question would be back to uh, both Willard Pool and uh, Mill Woods. I am hearing there is a shortage of lifeguards out there this year. There, there is only because there hasn't been a lot of training of new lifeguards. And um, we've been fortunate. We did a training in the um, earlier in March and we're looking to set another one up in May. So mm -hmm. we're trying to be very proactive. Are you comfortable that we would have enough lifeguards to fulfill both Millwoods and, and Willard? Well, if you ask me today, yes. Um, uh, we're, we're doing that right now and we're hiring right now and we're gonna be doing the other class in May. So um, if, if we weren't, what we would look at is we might reduce hours or we might, we really feel it's very important to open both pools this summer because we heard, yes, Millwoods was great it was nice to go to last summer, but for people living on the other side of town, it was difficult to get there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's much different pool setup. Yeah, everybody, yeah, everybody has a favorite. Gotcha. Okay, other than that, I mean, aside from the contractual and what Councilman Hill had brought up, the increase in pretty good job of keeping the budget uh, the same town manager has reduced uh, a couple I did see a line and maybe Gary you can shed some light on the line for the um, WEC program I think you had 15,000 in last year and again 15,000 this year that was a decrease you had decreased it by five thousand dollars and originally, Mayor, if I may, we had we had uh, asked again to increase that by five thousand in the new budget for next year to twenty thousand. So oh, okay. Manager cut back. Okay, so the the request was for twenty thousand. Yes. What did we? And I I believe we started funding that about five years ago. Do you remember what we started funding that at? I think we were at ten thousand. And then we went to 12.5 and then it went to 15. Okay. And the driver of those increases, is that for uh, salary or is it for programs? I, how much of the 15,000 is salary and how much is it for programs? That's all for salary because we do that in, in collaboration with the board, with the school district budget. And we, we have to show, we, with that position, they go out and get grants for the remainder of the salary. So they wanna see on the grantees part, uh, some type of match towards those funds. And we get a lot of grant program money because of that. Okay. Okay, any other questions for Kathy? And now, Eric, are you going separate? Yeah, you have social news services, a separate one. Okay. Any other questions for Kathy while we have her? Yes, please. Yep, Councilman Forrest. Kathy, um, I'd just like to talk to you about the, the use of the fields, um, baseball and soccer, lacrosse. Look, and if you could just, if you could tell, um, inform us, are we book solid with our fields right now? Is there spaces? Is it, you know, you can give me a little bit of differentiation. Obviously, you know, lacrosse might not use a baseball field, but maybe a soccer field, right? Um, lacrosse being an up and coming sport, right? At least from a number standpoint, are they stuck at Cove Park? There's not enough room, swimming, whatever it is. Can you tell us about the capacities in the, in the sporting world of Weathersfield and 
are we bumping up against it or, or do we have some gaps in some area where we're okay and so on and so forth? Um, we're maxed out on fields. Uh, with When lacrosse came in and they came in, they were the last sport to come in. So we were trying to find them spaces to play and the size of their field is a larger size field. So we're, uh, unless you go into the, the, the junior level. So putting lacrosse in, we've got every fields, every place we could think of that are relatively, I say flat. And so if you were to ask my opinion, we're maxed out and we're not, we're playing, we're playing on all our grass fields that are just that, that's what they are, they're grass. Over the years, we've upgraded one or two but we haven't upgraded many. So they're just playing on flat grassy land. So, um, so if another sport were to come in, we wouldn't have any place to go because the groups ask us all the time to look at different things to the point where the park board has gotten very involved with this and um, has now decided to set up um, semi-annual meetings with uh, starting this June, semi-annual meetings with the sports groups to hear back from them and see, can we do a better job of, of assigning fields so that in essence, everybody gets to play on a good field. The nice thing is the sports groups have been great at, they all wanna play on Catone for practice or a game. And they've been very good at sharing the field when the high school is not using it. Um, it's not that often because the high school pretty much keeps it busy, but the groups have demonstrated an ability to to really want to work together and we're going to want to encourage that. And is that the same level of use of the field for all sports? So, you know, is baseball just as strong as soccer, just as strong as lacrosse, just as strong as, I don't know, barracudas, you know, in the swimming world, right? And the rest of it? Yeah, or... baseball, our baseball, soccer, and uh, lacrosse, all the youth programs are um, very strong with the number of children that they have and the number of fields that they need. And uh, I noticed, for example, I was at, uh, you know, going my Little League game at Highcrest and the field next to the Highcrest baseball, Little League diamond used to be used, but it's not being used right now. Is there a, a reason for that? It used to, you know, use a soccer field for quite a long time, you know, youth, smaller soccer field, not high school, obviously. In the fall, it changes over to soccer. We, use, we do use it for soccer in the fall. And it just wasn't big enough to put lacrosse out there. The other thing we have to look at is uh, parking. And we try to be a little careful of how many things we put in one area that has very little parking. So there's a couple of reasons or ways that we try to kind of divvy out the fields. Is there discussion with the Board of Education as they move forward with their um, you know, phased approach for upgrading the elementary schools as to fields and building of fields and, and that type of thing? I'm, I'm not aware of any. I have not been involved in any. Okay. It might just be, you know, probably for you and the town manager that that dialogue probably should happen as they, you know, consider building some new elementary schools and replanning re out the public land, that that might be either an opportunity or a necessitated conversation as it works with Park and Rec and some of our sporting facilities. It seems like that's a obvious discussion point. So that just might be a heads up to have now before they get too far down the line and you know, a new Hamner is built or a new Highcrest is built and it's moved and then what happens to the empty space that's left and so on and so forth. That probably should be a conversation. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a long, could be a long time. Depends on if the referendum passes and then whether or not, uh, how long that span of rebuilding five schools would be. But yeah, that's definitely a good seed to plant for right now. But obviously if, you know, if a new uh, Hamner takes up the baseball field that's on Hamner now, right? <laughs> like then that's a baseball field that's down and a new place that's gonna be, or whatever the swing space is going to be in the world of things. Obviously, that's uh, that's going to impact uh, park and recreation. So, mm -hmm. okay. 
Any other questions for Kathy? Hearing none? Okay. So you well, thank you, Kathy. And I'll go into social and youth services. Oh, okay. Now. Yeah, if you want to, if you stay with social and youth services, I didn't know if you or Erica were going to take it. We're going to, we're going to do it both to get, well, we're going to share. Mm -hmm. On the social and youth services budget, I'm going to do the same thing. I'll go through this quickly and then you can stop me or you can have your questions at the end, whichever works best for you. Um, here again, when you look at the salaries on the staff, you're going to see that they're increased um, because of the um, union contracts. The, the, I get to say a little, the, the same thing with the benefits, except if you notice the health insurance, we had a staff member take a different plan. So there, there's a little bit of a savings there. When we go into our travel training and dues, you'll notice that there were some cuts made there. Um, dial a ride transportation for next year and our CRT lunch program are the professional services. Our support services, we had some cuts there and um, those help us with a lot of our prevention programs, our clinical services. Uh, on our public contributions, we also um, had to make cuts there. Those funds are uh, what the town pays as a donation to these mental health organizations who actually assist our residents. So every year, this actually started in the town council budget and then was actually moved a couple of years ago to the social service budget because it's, it's, um, it's the people in our residents out of right out of social services that it's impacting. You'll also see the um, agency supplies, which is the senior center programs, which we reduced a little bit. And then you get to our office supplies and then the end total. And so the increase here is, is very minimal for the overall budget. And what I'd like to point out is that we're able to do a lot of programs and um, outreach services for our residents through donations, through other organizations providing the services, if you look at our entire food bank operation, that is not in the operating budget at all. Um, we also do, out of that, we do uh, weekend meals. We do, uh, the weekend meals are for our families with children. We do commodity boxes for senior citizens that are below the poverty level. We do summer meals for uh, children when school's out. And we also have a mobile food share program. Some of this comes out of food share some of this is done out of donations. None of that is in the operating budget. We also do camperships. We have special needs. Um, uh, for other agencies, uh, we do energy assistance, renters rebate, and we have volunteers that do a tax assistance program that actually did happen this year at the community center in person. Um, so there's a lot that goes on that is totally outside the operating budget along with we do the holiday programs, be it Thanksgiving, the holiday gift program, the back to school program. And I just have to just say again that this community is amazing in what they support and the donations that they make. And that's been even more, more apparent during COVID. They've really reached out to help residents. So just to make you aware that we don't get enough time chances all the time to be able to say thank you to the residents. But some of this is through their generous donations. We also have had organizations donate to us. So it's been a mix of things that we've really been able to step up and staff has done an amazing job getting all of these services back out to residents. Um, so that's kind of the social services budget.
Any questions for Kathy or Erica on those? Deputy Mayor. Just, just one, uh, Kathy, um, and maybe I missed it in your presentation. The dial a ride transportation, did that stay the same last year? Was it, were there a lot less trips because of COVID or how did that work? Was it just as normal? Nope, there were a, a lot less trips because if you think about it, the recreational and the social piece where um, seniors or residents that use dial a ride weren't able to go to those types of uh, activities, but they were able to do the medical activities. So we literally sat down with our transportation company. We're in the second year of a three year contract and we sat down with them. We made an adjustment with them to the previous budget year for the April, May and June months. And then moving forward, we also, uh, we took a credit from the previous year, applied it to this year, and also basically cut our payment to them in half for every month as we've been going along, looking at what the rides were. So we actually will see some savings in dial a ride this year. <clears throat> but you basically you, you leveled it out, right? So adopted 2021 is the same as proposed? For next year, we did only because we, we think they're gonna be anxious to get up and running once we start opening. And we're going through that process now to determine wh what's gonna work with the senior center. A lot of trips are to the community center. So we're looking at that now. Thank you, that's all I had. Okay, good question, thank you. Anybody else with any questions? No, nope. yeah, I think I'm good. I mean, basically as you alluded to that health insurance savings of about uh, $10,000 offset the increase in salaries and then minimal increases going forward from then on with a couple of the town managers proposed cuts so okay hearing no questions i think we are good with social and youth services thank you very much thank you thank you good evening okay so Derek, pop on. Are we next one, Derek? Yep, 6.30, how are we doing for time? Oh boy. Derek, sorry about that. No problem, I'll try to talk quickly. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll just uh, go through line by line, uh, starting at the top with my budget. I think you all have it. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, so for the first category with uh, positions, <clears throat> you notice there's some changes um, that are in, in process. We've, we had some retirements uh, recently, some staff that had been here for a very long time. Um, so I'm taking this opportunity to try and restructure the department in a way that I feel will operate more efficiently and provide us better coverage and flexibility for construction operations, which is most of the year for us. So you can see some of the positions that we've had historically uh, being changed to some new positions um, that, I, that I just feel are going to work the best um, with, with those changes. And then some of the contractual uh, wage increases, uh, you know, there's a slight increase in salary and wages. Um, some of the other items either stayed the same, uh, went down. You might notice pensions went, you know, were eliminated. All my staff now is new enough that um, that doesn't have to be funded. And then um, continuing down, um, workers comp, all that's pretty much the same. So getting down to some of the uh, more specific items, uh, business cards, uh, there's a slight reduction, as you can see, uh, down $100. Um, the next category for travel training and dues, you see some line items are not funded, uh, other ones are. Um, the total is approximately the same. I'm, I'm trying to clean some of it up because some of it seemed to be dupli 
duplication of information. So I wanted to try and pull things together that made sense to be put together. The, the increase is really because right now or historically we've paid for one professional engineering license and one uh, land surveying license, at least since I've been here. Um, with the positions we're looking to hire, we are looking to hire another professional engineer uh, to assist with you know, engineering work that I'm just really overloaded with at this time. Um, so with that, that's the extra uh, license that we need to pay for is really the only increase in that particular category. Everything else is just being consolidated. For office machinery, you see there's some reductions there. Um, we do have a service agreement for our plotter, you know, supplies. And then there's uh, machine repairs, which are, are variable every year. But um, in talking with the town manager, um, felt that that would be an area we could make some cuts for this upcoming fiscal year. Uh, next category, repair and maintenance of uh, equipment. Uh, we've talked about this uh, you know, in the past. We do our pavement markings every year out of my operating budget. Um, a few years back, we decided that we were only going to do half the parking lots one year and half the parking lots the next. So each year we rotate between uh, town building parking lots and school parking lots. At the same time, we do all of the pavement markings in the town right away. Then we have some uh, survey equipment, you know, routine maintenance. Usually uh, winter time, we try and get that uh, information, uh, that equipment um, tuned up a little bit while we're not using it as much. Um, we have our sidewalk contract. We're in the middle now of a two year contract with our sidewalk contractor. This will be the last year. Um, at this point, I'm expecting to go out back out to bid this coming winter. Generally, we put $35,000 to that and um, we try and use it as creatively as possible because we tend to spend, um, spend quite a bit of it. CCTV drainage inspections, that is um, just inspecting pipes. When we have drainage issues, um, one thing we've been trying to do is if it makes sense, we do pipe inspections. Um, sometimes just replacing the pipe could be a lot more costly than finding where the problem is and just replacing that problem. So um, that's something I've been carrying in my operating budget to have available uh, as needed. Um, at this time, I'm putting out some work for that, which is about eight or nine thousand dollars. So usually, we try to group it together when we do put it out. But you know, one uh, one issuance of work could be around that much. Wetlands flagging, we keep that for our projects uh, as needed. When we're doing a project that requires the flagging, then we'll we'll have it done um, for our permit approvals through the Inland Wetlands and Conservation Commission. Legal ads for Inland Wetlands is the same. Um, our, our survey hubs and stakes and monuments. Um, are the same. A uh, slight reduction, as you see in uh, our clothing and shoes allowance. Uh, most of that that's remaining will be utilized uh, through our um, obligated uh, work shoe uh, for, our, for my employees. Um, but that was another area where the town manager and I felt we could reduce it a little bit. Going to the top of page two, we have our uh, IT equipment and software. So we have different software that's for engineering, uh, surveying, hydraulics, um, PDF software that we use that's uh, made specifically for um, using AutoCAD plans. Um, we, of course, we have ArcView and then our, our GPS network subscription that we have when our surveyors go out and do work. Um, sometimes they're doing GPS work, so we need access to the satellite network for that. So that's our annual subscription for that. Then for the last category, miscellaneous survey equipment, uh, we just carry some funds there in case we have an issue with something breaking down or need something special as far as um, a particular project um, just to have available for staff. So you can see overall, it was a 1.87% reduction, about $15,000. Be happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, just uh, one question, Derek. And some of the other departments, like uh, the building department, uh, fire marshal, they have uh, training requirements, certifications. To, in your department, is that just the individual's personal engineering license, or do you have state requirements or whatever that you have to maintain a certain level of training? At this time, the state doesn't require uh, engineers and surveyors to go through uh, a required training to maintain their licenses. A lot of states do, Connecticut doesn't do that yet. Um, we do carry some budget for attending conferences and things of that nature because uh, you know, it benefits us, I think, in the town to stay current with some of the latest techniques and things that are going on. So we do it on our own when we can and we have time. Um, however, there's no uh, state requirements for us to maintain that. Thanks.
Any other questions for Derek? One question I have circuit TV, and I, I think are we do we do that in house closed circuit TV? Do we contract out for that? I mean, what's the fifteen thousand dollars pay for? Yeah, we do contract out. We don't have the equipment. It takes specialized cameras that can run you know, hundreds of feet up pipes. Um, usually, we do you know we do it for drainage. Um, from time to time, if it has to do with a sewer issue, we'll get MDC to do the sewer inspections for their system. Um, however, we do have to hire a contractor to do that. So that's basically put a, a robotic equipment up through the pipe and allow us to see what's going on in there. You know, sometimes we've, you know, we've had issues in town where we've had flooding for a long time and we were able to do that and see that the pipes were three quarters full of sediment in certain areas, you know, flush them out and address the problems a lot cheaper than, you know, looking at a pipe replacement project, which was being considered. So um, mm -hmm. there's a, there, it, it varies. It's there in case we need it. We don't know of every problem that we have, but a lot of times we'll get calls. There's an issue at a certain location. It's nothing evident at the surface. So that's the best way for us to figure out what's going on. That's why I carry a budget, a line item budget for it. Got it. And it, but it, it is contracted out. So that's $15,000. It's not annually to run the operation. It's internally, it's, it's to contract out for it. Okay. Yeah, we're currently in the process of uh, getting a non-call contractor. I'm looking for this year and next year, so they're available as needed. Like I said, usually we'll, we'll identify some locations, group them together, and then put put out a notice to proceed to have them do that amount of work. So that's what it's for, to fund the contractor's work. Okay. No, looks like a pretty lean budget. So thank you for consolidating some of those uh, fees as well. Um, look like two line items. Um, well, actually split up between dues, ASCE, and then PE and LS licenses. That's split up, but you removed the APWA conference and then reduced a couple, uh, increased one and then eliminated a couple you put all of them together into the 25. So it does show an increase though of about $500. Is that simply because things have gone up, costs have gone up? Yes, that to some extent. And um, you know, historically, since I've been here, we've had two licenses to pay for, a professional engineering license and a land surveyor license. I'm carrying one extra license for the professional engineer we're looking to hire at this time. We're in that process now. Um, so okay. that's mostly where that increase comes from. Um, some of those other ones you mentioned were just consolidated into the dues and meetings of APWA, ASE, and CALS line item, which are some of the different organizations, professional organizations we belong to. Right, gotcha. Okay, and then finally, the project manager position that is currently vacant, if I'm not mistaken. That is correct. We uh, we recently hired a, a couple of staff members. I had a I had an engineer on board as a construction manager. Um, he uh, just he was here for about six weeks and then found a better opportunity, a higher paying job at another municipality. So mm -hmm. I lost him. So we restructured that a little bit because since I had put since I had advertised for that position, we had another retirement. That was my second of the two. So that's why we're restructuring a little bit again. But yeah, that position is currently vacant as well as our construction inspector position is vacant. And that's due to be, uh, we just internally posted or uh, plan to internally post for that this week. Okay. Because construction season here, I'm, I'm at a real loss having lo lost that engineer at the time I did, right? When we're getting busy. So we're trying to fill these as quickly as we can, but I want to find the right people at the same time. Gotcha. Okay. Hey, Derek, you want to run through CIP while we got you? Sure. I'll put I'll put the list up if okay. you give me share rights, Gary. Good night. That works. Everybody see that? Yes, I can see it. Okay, um, yes, I can run through uh, the list here. Uh, so the first item, 
for drainage, uh, town dam repairs, uh, construction. Um, I had gotten some partial funding last year. Uh, we have four dams in town that need repairs. They're, they're not considered major repairs, they're considered minor repairs, but it's something DEP has um, seen and directed us to address. So this is to uh, provide some more money for design and construction. Um, I'm hoping with the funds between last fiscal year and this upcoming fiscal year that I would be able to uh, complete at least one of the four projects um, soon, maybe by the end of this year, depending on how quickly we can get that um, a consultant on board. Second item is for replacement of the Copper Mill Road culvert over Golf Brook. Um, that is just for preliminary design. We are going to apply for uh, state local bridge program funds for that um, because it is a pretty costly project and that is available. Uh, the thing is you, you really, to be competitive in that program, you need to have some preliminary design work done and have a good idea on your costs. So this is to retain a consultant to bring us to that. We've done some conceptual layout, but we're gonna bring it a little bit further. So when we can apply, usually they put this solicitation out every couple of years, I'm looking to apply for the next one. So this will get us prepared to do that. Um, that particular funding source is, uh, is, is an 80-20 split, I believe, it's, it's 50. There's, a, there's different uh, funding sources depending on the project, but um, the town will be contributing. The project overall is about $600,000 project and that's our highest drainage issue um, as far as needing to re be repaired at this point. We have a number of them, but that's the worst one um, that we're looking to do aside from Spring Street, which is gonna be a separate funding source to address that. Um, the third category for pavement, road and parking lot evaluation, the asset management software. Uh, that, that is related to our, uh, area, as a lot of you are aware, we, every five years we have our roads evaluated. Um, it's usually a good time. Every three to five years is pretty typical. That way you can get a, a fresh look at where your roads are and help us in prioritizing the paving program as, well, as far as what roads are gonna be coming up in future years. Um, while we're doing that, the parking lots have not been inspected since 2002. Um, so I would like to, you know, come put that together with the, with the roads and have um, one consultant do evaluations for all of that. Um, that will help me with just CIP planning for parking lots going forward as well. And that request included purchasing some asset management software. We're using very outdated software that is no longer being supported. Um, so there is a lot, uh, there's a lot of software options out there now that are more uh, cloud-based and more robust, easier to use. And uh, we're looking to upgrade our software as, as part of this whole process so we can um, have better information to present to you and better information to, uh, to work with as far as analyzing um, what's gonna be the most cost effective or get the best bang for our buck um, type of pro programs coming up for our paving. Fourth item for pavement, Straddle Hill area road settlement. We, we have an issue up at Saddle Hill, Silo Drive, Haystack up in those roads where we have a lot of uh, sinkholes forming um, drainage has issues, sanitary sewer has issues. We have TV'd those pipes and MDC has TV'd their pipes. They, they look to be in pretty good condition. Um, there's nothing evident as to why this is happening. We think it has to do with uh, backfill material and high groundwater that's been out there in recent years. Um, but we're, we're gonna have a consultant evaluate that. This is really to start um, funding uh, construction. We're gonna need to address the subsurface issues before we pave the road and those roads are coming up due for paving. So we're looking to get ahead of it. So this is to start at least do construction in some of the worst areas right now. Uh, but that, that construction is still to be designed and determined we're, we're in the process of um, or I need to still put out an RFP to get a consultant on board to look at that because uh, there's something more uh, complex going on out there and we need some field investigation, soils testing to figure it out. Uh, for the first fire category, fire station two, um, this is uh, for addition, architectural design for uh, addition for women's uh, locker facilities. Um, my understanding is we don't have any of those in any of our firehouses right now. We do have uh, women firefighters. So this is to get the design started so we can um, look at fire station two was selected as the first choice for uh, building those facilities. And this is to start design the uh, allocation recommended. Um, then the next category for fire, fire station one, two, and three exhaust extractors. That is for systems to um, extract the exhaust, as you would imagine, from the bays. Um, often they have vehicles in there that have to be running, and um, none of the fire stations have this system. Um, so that was put in by the fire chief as a request. Um, the $45,000 would cover all three uh, facilities. Sidewalks, uh, we talk about sidewalk ramp replacements, um, ADA uh, tiles. 
that is a requirement um, by Department of Justice that when we do roads, uh, particularly paving roads as part of our paving program, we are required to upgrade all the adjoining ramps to meet ADA standards. So this uh, request is related to that. It also is utilized in other areas where we have complaints or we have um, tripping hazards or other issues that need to be addressed. Um, sometimes what we've been trying to do lately, uh, like with MDC, when they're doing paving roads, try and get out there and do the ramps ahead of time as well. Um, so that funding goes specifically for ramps um, to be replaced and upgraded. Tom Buildings, a roof consultant. Uh, that is a, uh, we usually have a five-year contract. This is the, to fund the first year of, the, of a five-year contract with Tremco. Um, that was requested by physical services. Uh, next item is roof routine maintenance. Sally Katz carries a line item for um, miscellaneous repairs that might be required that are um, more extensive than the typical roof routine maintenance price that we paid for in the previous item. So that is a $20,000 allocation. Usually it's been around 20 or 25 uh, each year um, to uh, have that available. For school buildings to replace the Charles Wright portable units, uh, you may be aware we high crest units were uh, replaced or reconstructed last year. Um, this is to do a similar process at Charles Wright, uh, utilizing town staff, as was done with Highcrest. Um, so that's the estimated uh, cost to do that in-house. Next item for schools is replace roofs at Highcrest School. Um, there are a, a number of roofs up there that are in need of repair. I believe there's three of them. Um, some money has been allocated in previous years. So this funding would supplement that and allow at least two of the three roofs to be completed. Um, at least that's my understanding. So that will get us uh, uh, at least two of the three roofs redone. My understanding there's very severe leaks on these roofs. And they've been band they've been band-aid repairs for a number of years, so they need to um, do something more extensive. Parks and Recreation Community Center repair the parking lots. Um, I've been working with Kathy Bagley on that. Um, there's a number of areas that are uh, safety concerns. There's potholes forming. Um, there's uh, tripping hazards. So most of the parking lot's in pretty good shape, but there's certain areas that are not, particularly the parking area in front is heavily used and in bad shape. So this is to do repairs in specific areas to address the safety concerns um, there. That is a partial funding um, from what was fully needed, but we, uh, we felt like we could at least do something with some funds and address the worst areas first. Community center, replace hallway lobby. Uh, replace hallway and lobby carpet and blinds. Um, that's been something that's been on the list for a little while. This is for the main entrance uh, into the building. Um, the carpet is very worn. It's, it's coming mm -hmm. apart. It's causing a, a, a tripping hazard, a safety hazard. So it is to replace that with uh, either carpeting. I think the, um, Kathy's been exploring some different options for the surface material, but that would take care of the main entrance and hall and also uh, drapes in the building are, uh, from what I understand, very outdated. The hardware is um, in need of repair and hard to find. So this would replace the hardware and the blinds um, associated with it. Parks and Recreation uh, field, <clears throat> Greenfield softball fencing. Uh, this is a project that's been on the list for a few years. Um, the fencing out there is in need of repair. Uh, my understanding is the posts can be reutilized, but this is to replace the, uh, the fence panels themselves. This will be supplemented with some um, existing CIP funds from another project to uh, get, get this project done um, uh, this upcoming year. For Parks and Recs and Nature Center, <clears throat> this is for a concrete sidewalk and ADA repairs uh, leading into the building. Um, there's been some issues out there with some uh, safety hazards that uh, need to be addressed. So that was the request for that. And then finally, economic development. Um, this is a, a partial funding to get started with the plan of conservation and development. Um, there's also an ADA transition plan, um, ho affordable housing plan. Uh, I'm sorry, it's affordable housing plan, the POCD, <clears throat> and then also to start funding uh, the Silas Dean Highway uh, Revitalization Master Plan that has, uh, hasn't been looked at in a number of years and um, is, is in need of an upgrade. So there's three plans that are going to be part of that. This is partial funding to get it started. Um, the CEI, um, CIAC has committed to funding the remainder of the funds, which I believe is around $50,000 uh, next year to finish the project, but this at least gets um, that started. So I can answer any Thank questions. Thank you, Derek. Sure. 
any questions for Derek? I can't see anybody, so. Oh, just... uh, Mike, I did have my hand raised. Yep. That's right. um, can we go back to the, uh, the chart, please? Okay. Thanks. Um, the first question, Derek, I see the two pavement numbers for 75,000. Um, is that in addition to the pavement program? Is that like we're adding adding more in or is that the extent of the paving program for this year? Yeah, that is separate from the road funds. Um, tip, historically, it's been taken out of CIP is my understanding. I believe five years ago, uh, that was at the time Mike Turner had left and I was transitioning in. So we did use road funds, but that is separate from the road funds. That is to basically, uh, you know, get the roads evaluated so we can prepare our programs. Straddle Hill area road settlement is specific to uh, Straddle Hill lower section that I get a lot of complaints about. It is in very bad shape and in need of repair. So that we're hoping those funds would at least cover doing that lower portion of the road. Um, but that's all contingent on getting our consultant on board and figuring out what the extent of the repairs are going to be. So from the CIP, there's 25,000 that's added to the road funds that we have for paving. So there's really the full paving program. When we look at the road funds, we should add 25,000 to it. Is that correct? No, these would be kept as separate CIP accounts, like most of our CIP programs. So it's kept separately from the road funds that we use for the actual programs. How it's kept is, I wasn't really thinking about. What I'm thinking about is how much resources are we putting toward the improvement of our roads? So am I looking, if I if I'm looking at it from that perspective, is it add twenty five thousand dollars to the road funds, or are there is there more than that? No, I mean, yeah, I guess you could look at it at, at, in that way. Yes, we are spending it on on roads. Um, they're different types of projects, which is why they aren't being taken out of, or it wasn't recommended to be taken out of the uh, the pay, the road funds themselves. Got it. Um, and it, is there a additional list than this right here? This is 756. Was the CIP, um, you know, group that puts this together? Were they were they told to be limited to 750 thousand, or how did we come to that number? The group uh, targeted 900 thousand dollars, which has been typical for the last few years. Uh, we did. They allocated 900 thousand, <clears throat> excuse me, and then an extra 100 thousand in case funds were available. At the same time, they prioritize what they would recommend as priority projects from one to 19, I think we had. Right. So I, I don't have it in front of me, but I believe town manager had looked at reducing some of those projects to get the number down as part of the overall budget. They do always remember us as a council reviewing about a million dollars a year in CI in capital improvements. But now this is only 750. Could I could we get the remainder of the amounts up to a million dollars? That's available. Um, I don't have it in front of me. I think Mike maybe is bringing up where the cuts were made to these particular projects is what it looks like. I think maybe Mike or Gary could speak a little more to how, the, how they arrived at these. Like if you wanna, can you zoom in a little? Oh, go ahead. So I'll, I'll just kind of quickly speak to it. And if there's additional questions and, or Mike, if you want to jump in, you can as well, but basically. Yeah, we I go back, Gary, can you, yeah, I actually, I can blow it up on mine, but I don't know if anybody else can blow it up on theirs. I don't think so. You want to see this? So there's that. And then there was uh, CIAC also recommended another hundred thousand. In funding rights. Four season so, so I'm wondering, like we, we see 750. It looks <laughs> like CIC did the job of prioritizing at least a million. Maybe they did more. And I'm looking for what was that prioritization in the amounts before it got pre-cut. The yeah, um Mike O'Neill, do you have a copy of the prioritization or no? Uh yeah, I think I do. Hold on. 
Is this on a page in our budget, this section? Or is yes, that is. Is this additional in the additional section? No, it's in the, it's actually, it's in the pink book. Sorry, Rose, look. Pink book. I have, I have it available if you want me to share it. Sorry. Um, I don't know if I can give you sharing rights. You might have to send it to me. Just see if okay. you can get in. All right. Well, if you just tell us where it is in the pink. Yeah, uh, I don't need, we don't need to belabor this. I'm just, if you've got a list and a prioritization, if you could point us to no, point me to it or point us to it. Unless there's more to be said here and I'm inappropriately cutting off. I apologize for that. Pink book, budget fiscal year, this one here. That's where you'll find this. That's on page D2. But that doesn't have that doesn't prioritize things. That's in a separate document. I think that comes out of CIAC, right, Derek? Yes, I yeah. Just forwarded the list to Gary that has the rank. prioritization. Okay, and it looks like that was reduced by 140, <clears throat> which brings it 748. 40 brings us up to nine. So the million dollars is that plus the hundred thousand dollars in funding for the replacement of a four season unit at town hall and library. And that's the million dollars that they looked at. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. And what is a four season unit? I don't really know what that is. Uh, <clears throat> from what I recall, that's a, that's a unit that controls the heating and air conditioning for the library and part of the town hall. Um, it's been, from what I understand, it's maybe 25, 30 years old and they've been it's been limping along. So it, it's as part of a planning process, they're just looking at securing funds to replace it because it's gotten to be um, that time. Okay. Next follow up question. There's a portable line. I think it was $100,000. Um, is that a portable line where we're purchasing the portable or is that similar to we need materials to build a portable like we did at Highcrest or other? It'll be, my understanding is going to be handled the same way we did at Highcrest done by in-house staff. So that is materials um, from what I understand, equipment that they may need for it. So it'll be done the same way. And Correct. lastly, understood. Lastly, is it possible to get the last 10 years of just the CIP amounts that we've allocated as a council? I'm, I'm trying to understand, is this 750 in line with our trending, what we've done to support the capital budget of our town? And that's the last question I have. Thanks for the help. All right. Um, and then this, the 756, that was decided by the CIAC or? No, <clears throat> I, I reduced, I think the CIAC, I'll do the quick math, was what, 876? It was close to 900, that was their target. Yeah, or 896, they were close. I, I reduced it by $140,000. Um, I did go through, and it's gonna be hard to see, but I did it based off of, um, this is the ranking that they gave it. If you, they kind of broke down by category, project name. You guys can see this, right? Yep. Okay. Um, let's see if I can get a... Is this on a page somewhere, Barry? I don't know if this was included in the budget. This probably wasn't. This is a, an internal document. Is it possible? Uh, would you be comfortable sharing this internal document along with the 10 year uh, trending? Yeah. And, um, there may okay. be a reason you're not, and that's totally no, cool. Oh, yeah, no. It's, maybe it's notes on here. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, it just, it, I, it's public information, so I have no problem sharing it. It just didn't seem relevant necessarily to the budget book itself. Um, you know, and so what I did is I went through. And I might have actually done a different Excel spreadsheet now that I'm thinking about it, but I re-ranked these. I just started with uh, what's the highest rank, I think is 19. And I worked backwards from 19 down to, I think I got to maybe 11 um, to reduce and whittle away. And I work with Derek and we talked a little bit about priorities and the number and what you could get done for that dollar amount. Um, you know, with the idea that again, council prerogative, if I can find money or if there's you know, a creative way to, to, um, uh, to bring this back whole. And again, that number is 896 right here. You can see it, um, that I would try to do so. 
but again, trying to uh, come with as, as a responsible budget as I could um, without eliminating. Last year we hit um, CIP pretty harshly, um, but it was what we had to do based off of what was in front of us at the time. Um, I thought maybe 140 based off of what these projects are um, were more realistic in terms of what we could get to in the next 12 months um, and what were actual priorities, safety issues that needed to be addressed. Um, I think historically, and again, you can't quote me on this, but I think historically your number has been around 900,000. Um, and so this would, this would be a reduction. So again, I, I can forward this to you. I can kind of verify, I'll work with Mike and pull out old budget books and see what was previously allocated for the last decade um, to see. The other, uh, the other thing to keep in mind here, an option for the council is, and it was a rationale for the uh, the $140,000 reduction was not arbitrary. Um, we've actually got um, another source of funding that the council uh, might consider to restore the 140. Um, we have a, what we refer to as the correct trust, which was the $2 million that the town received when the, um, was it Northeast Utilities, Northeast Utilities yeah. sold a building um, that was turned into a school. Um, they gave us $2 million and we've had a policy of using uh, $90,000 of interest earned on that account. Um, annually, we put that into the CIP reserve. And the, the concept at the inception of that trust fund was that the $2 million was a, was a corpus that would generate roughly uh, what the tax revenues on that property were. Um, so that's the basis for the 90,000 that we always do. We went back and looked at that a couple months ago and um, and we don't we only draw down to the two million. We don't we don't eat into the corpus of that account at all. Um, but there was about uh, there was a two million one hundred and forty thousand um, a month or so ago. So we took one hundred and forty thousand out of the investments. It's still in the trust but we, we took it out of the market, so to speak, and put it into, into cash um, in the trust, but that's there. So, so there's $140,000 again, which is in excess of the 2 million that um, you know, we don't have the authority to, to use that and include it in the proposed budget, but that's something that the council could consider to, uh, to use those funds and, and stay within the, you know, within the, uh, you know, the, the use, the, the agreed upon use of that trust fund. Mike, how, how could we use those funds without allocating those funds? Um, like we wouldn't be authorizing the use of those funds without putting it in the budget though. Right, but you could put it in, I can't. So, you know, we don't, we don't, management doesn't have the authority or we just don't, again, we were telling you about it. We just didn't put it in. We don't, you know, we're not presumptuous that way. Understood. Much right, like so to use those monies, the council would vote to increase the CIP budget by an allocated amount. Is that what you're telling me? Yes. With, and with then the would we would we recognize a revenue then from the correct trust as well in order to offset that to you know keep the budget sort of even so to speak or wash? It would be oh. it, yes, you would. It would not be a revenue to the general fund, so you wouldn't see it in the revenue budget. It would be a transfer. To the to the capital improvement fund, and the would you rec fund. if we were to lean that way? Would you recommend mm -hmm. doing that at the same time? It would be a, a move, a transfer, and an increase in in the budget amount. Yes. All yeah. Right. Thanks. Just to follow up on that point, um, just hypothetically, could we um, just use that money to? offset the you know what's in the CIP currently you know the 750 or thereabouts is that um at, you know we I as opposed to increasing it back to 900 and using the 140 you know can we keep it at the 750 and use that 140 to offset it it's the council's authority over those funds and again we <clears throat> you know we reduced, I mean, Gary, you speak to this, we reduced capital by 140 
you know, and, and again, that's just, that was our thinking was, you know, we would, we had identified a way for the council to restore that, but the council has authority over the correct trust. Right. And using the 140 for any capital projects would be in keeping with the policy that was set for that trust. Thanks. Was it was it your idea when you cut the 140 that you'd be able to use it for the correct trust though? That's why the 140 was cut? Yes. Yes. Okay. We sometimes apply logic to the things that we do. Um, <laughs> the other thing to keep in mind is that we still have these unknown federal funds. And a lot of them have what I'm, you know, we're still waiting to find out what we can use them for and what they can be designated for. So you may have access to those funds for infrastructure related projects which may qualify some CIP projects. So those are just things to consider. And just one more thing to uh, put into your uh, thought process here. Thinking back to the conversation we had last Wednesday about the, the premium, I think the number was, was it 58,000? That was unexpended, that was left? That was 89 uh, or something like that. Maybe 89. That can be applied to debt service, but it can also be used for capital needs. You know, really in this case, because the bonds were issued for the high school, it would be for capital needs at the high school, but that's another source of, uh, you know, funds. That's another way that that can be used. Could that be applied to principal? Yes, that's what, that's what we've done with all of, you know, 3 million plus of the premium up to this point. So that that was actually applied to principal, or was that applied to debt service on a particular year? I was understanding um, it was debt service. Technically speaking, well, not te it, it actually it's applied against interest because it's can right. be seen as a refunding if you apply it against principal. But that's that's. Oh, that's, when you get into that funky rule, right? Is, really, is that basically. the arbitrage rule or something like that? Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I got one question for Derek, if I could. The um, paving evaluation programs, do you, Derek, do you think that's something that the town could take on their own eventually, or is that always a, you know, out of your wheelhouse type thing where you would subcontract it? Uh, well, it we have 105 miles of road to inspect um, to, to ensure that it all gets done together at the same time in a reasonable amount of time. I would think that's something we're going to have to put out. I just, I'm nowhere near staffed enough to be able to allocate somebody, you know, that much time to do that. And you also have to have that expertise. These companies that do it, do it quite often. Um, some of them do it with, with vehicles that automatically detect cracks in the roads and, and issues of that nature. Um, depending on the company we hire. So, you know, I, I don't see us being able to do that in-house in, in the near future, um, just based just based on those reasons. Okay, fair enough. I didn't know if you put a glass of water on your dashboard and took a ride around town or something. It won't stay there for long. <laughs> Not on Church Street. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the deputy mayor has walked 105 miles of this town regularly, so you could probably just point them out to us. Yeah, but I always walk on the sidewalk. <laughs> where, where there is sidewalk. Um, just to go along with um, the reductions, proposed reductions, or actually, well, I guess they are still, everything is still proposed reductions. If you could bring that um, page D2 of the pink book back up, Gary. I think that was you or maybe Mike had it. you see that? The one where, yeah, not that one though. The, the oh, one from the actual budget list. book. Gotcha, yep. This one. And I won't belabor it because we do have a couple more going on. So uh, let's see, we are still doing the sidewalk ramps ADA compliance, that less $10,000 mark, 
is that does that mean we're we think we can get what we need to get out of the AD compliance for the pads with the fifty five thousand dollars that's in the CIP? Yes, we would prioritize the ramps uh, for those roads that are being repaved. Um, you know, as I stated earlier, there's some extra funds in there for other areas that come up. Um, so we would just, you know, I felt, you know, I talked with Tom Manager about that, that, you know, we'd still meet our obligations with that funding amount. Okay. So the 55000 would cover what we are expected to repair. Correct. This, this fiscal year. Uh, roof, let's see, maybe not the roof maintenance because we are con always doing roof maintenance. Uh, the $20,000 for town buildings, again, same rationale, Derek, that we can get away with the $20,000. The additional five is just project, you know, just whittling it down or would we, can we cover what we need to do with the 20000 Those funds are intended to cover the unknown, although I believe there is um, some funds you know, available for that. So I think in talking with Tom Andrew, we felt um, you know taking a little bit out of it should still, you know, I can't speak to that because that's really not my department, but I, we felt that it would be uh, okay to do that and still be able to cover what we expect would come up. Remember it's okay. within, within that 12 month period in the reach and and you know, obviously we can't anticipate emergencies um, over and above and kind of looking at a trend line to see what we can, we can manage, you know, can we do it long-term every year? This is for that 12 month period, you know, at some point the bill comes due, you have to address them. So you just hope in any year that you make those reductions, that's not the year that you have the most amount of issues spread amongst the most amount of buildings. Mm -hmm. It's a gamble. Right. Um, replacing Charles Wright part, portable unit. It was 105. It's 100,000 now. I mean, you think realistically that's we can that's a savings. But in the hundred thousand dollars, like the high crest ones, we could do the work substantially less than the four hundred thousand that had been budgeted in prior years, prior budgets. Yeah. The, uh, the unique difference there is this one does need a roof where yep. high didn't um and there's some i think there's structurally i think it's still kind of the same thing there's some there's some things that need to be addressed underneath but i think you know a hundred thousand versus 105 if it ends up being 102 thousand you know do can i stretch the 102 that type of thing it's gotcha and same thing with the hallway and lobby carpets and blinds i mean it's an only five thousand but you think we can get away with fully carpeting and um the area and replacing the blinds with the i think it was twenty thousand thirty thousand was it before twenty five for concrete oh no looking at the wrong one community center was thirty community center you're looking at the community center windows and blinds all the mm -hmm. lobby it's 35 grand, so you're squeezing that. There. I mean, some of this, because we haven't competitively bid it or we haven't gone out to bid, some of it is a guesstimate based off of getting actual estimates from contractors. So, you, you know, you don't, the, the frustrating part is you don't know until you go out. We might not have enough to do it even at 35 grand, right? So um, I'm kind of taking the risk, of course, I'm taking the risk during a time when construction costs have gone up. Um, but by the time we get to this, maybe they've leveled off a little bit and we're looking at something different. Um, you know, we have a very created staff here. So my hope is maybe we can save on certain parts where we might not be able to on others. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. That just explains a little bit of, um, you know, I was there for the first meeting of the CIAC, but, um, Derek, you and Derek, and I believe Tom was as well for those, it just explains a little bit of where the rationale um, played into uh, to getting these numbers. Okay, no, thank you. If I could just chime in, you know, the the CIAC starts out with about, I think it was somewhere around $4 million worth of projects. So 
you know, we obviously can't fund all of it. So uh, we kind of worked or the, the group worked to try and pick projects that they could complete and get off the list rather than, you know, put 25,000 each year for four years. And by the time you finally have enough, the project costs have increased and you never get ahead. So that was their, that was kind of the marching orders that uh, they were trying to come up with. And uh, that's where we ended up. Um, and the target was originally the 900,000 and we threw another 100,000 in there. If, you know, there was extra funds available, that's what we would, uh, you know, target a certain item, so. With all due respect, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I think it was the marching orders of maybe the mayor at the time who said, I, I wanna pay for things that have a finish date that we can complete and not continue to add money towards and money. And I wanna see some finished products finally. Yes. Sorry, so. I thunder away from you there. I will share it. Okay. Any other questions for Derek on either the CIP or town engineering? Seeing none. Okay, good. Thank you. Have a good night. And we've got good job, Mark Derek. And Fauna. Who wants to go first? Marlene? Good evening. Um, there's not too much that has changed in my budget. There's except for the increase in the process to send the bills out, to print them and all that. Um, the cost has gone up slightly from our software provider. And there's a little bit of an increase in salaries due to contractual. And other than that, there isn't really much that changed. Um, the online service, so the taxpayers can pay online, went up slightly a little bit too, but that's also hosted by QDS that prints our bills. So their items went up a little bit. It will probably, might be a savings in my department. I'm not sure um, the technical assistant has left and went to another department. So the new person coming in will probably be starting at a lower salary than she was making. Okay. Uh, I'm just going through. And pension did go up, so that was probably your biggest driver. Mm -hmm. Everything else? right around the same. Okay, any questions for Marlene? I might not have one directly related to this. If you can give us just a, an idea, how did we do with tax collections this year? Given every- Right now, um, current levy is at 100% of the budget. Prior levy is at 113% of budget right now. Okay. So we're doing pretty well considering there was a pandemic and we're a little bit, or usually we always hit a hundred percent, but usually closer to June. We did it earlier this year and I just issued a bunch of warrants. So I anticipate more is gonna be coming in in the next 30 days. Okay. Any tax sales this past year? No, we did not have, we had the one that was supposed to be held right when the pandemic started. We had it in October, but it was only um, one piece of land that was left and the bidders ended up backing out. Okay. And, and we saw no real effect of the um, reduction in the penalty from the 18% down to Three percent. Um, there was a little bit of one. Interest is at eighty nine percent right now of the budget. I mean, it could be a little higher if the interest rate had been higher, but we will probably make up for that with the warrants because the warrants did go out at the higher interest rate. Okay. 
Okay. You don't have to answer this question if you don't want. There's a proposal out there uh, at the legislature to decrease that 18% penalty down to, and I forget what it's proposed to go down to. Would that have a significant impact on our budget? I I would I believe so, yes, because I think they're looking at 12%. Well, 18 down to 12, that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. The, it would definitely reduce the amount of penalties that would come in. Okay. Have we factored, I mean, it's not factored into this budget, obviously, but have you looked at what that impact would be? No, I have not. Okay. I know it's the emails that I get from CCM mentioned some of these. Okay. Any questions for Marlene while we got her? Good. Um, when do you, when did the position for the technical assistant open up? Uh, it was a week ago, la it was last month, not this Monday, the following, the previous Monday, because it closes this coming Friday, the 30th. Okay. And we have people already applied? I have not checked with Cheryl yet, so I'm not sure, but it's also out with my association. So it's out there, you know, hopefully if someone from the association, then we'll get someone in there who's already certified and we won't have to worry about doing that. Mm. Okay. That's a savings. Good. Thank you. Thank you. And... Okay. Thank you, Marlene. Good night. Good night. Fauna, how are you? Good. How are you? Oh, so, um, well. yeah, <laughs> that's good. Just Good. Okay. You guys can hear me okay? We, yes, we can. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so um, my name's Fauna. I'm the assessor here in the town. Um, we have an office of three people. Uh, we compile the grant list, which establishes the tax base for the town. Uh, we do that by assessing real estate motor vehicles and personal property. Um, the grant list did go up this past year, uh, 29.8 million, uh, which is an increase about 1.28% over last year uh, after BAA numbers. Um, so see some of the programs that, one of the programs that is just now wrapping up is our audit program that we put through a couple years ago. Um, and this audit program was based on actual findings. We didn't pay anything if they didn't find anything. Um, we only paid percentages on what was found. Um, and we actually ended up bringing in about $160,000 off that. Um, so I, there'll probably be about five or six more accounts to come through, but it's, it's wrapping up. Uh, that is one of our uh, budget numbers that was higher last year and it's lower uh, this year. Um, so going through our budget, most of the stuff off the top is all contractual or has been passed down to us from Mike, um, you know, the pension things up 10, but Mike said that's a, a budgetary process for the pension, not really ours, um, but it's in our budget. Um, otherwise, copy and binding, uh, still the same, travel training and dues. We have not increased that because stuff uh, or decreased that because stuff is starting to happen again for us. Uh, we're having meetings and stuff, so we don't want to bring that down. And I think we probably had money left over last year that was probably went into the general fund. Um, our professional services is the same. Uh, that's our software support contracts that we have for our two softwares that we have to use. Our copier maintenance is. I think that we put back in again because we're using everybody's hand-me-down machines. Some of them aren't covered anymore. Our copier is becoming obsolete again. Um, so we did put money in for that. 
um, and our legal is advertisements about the same because we have to run ads for the BAA twice a year. Um, so the but the audit number is down. There's five thousand that we've we've always pretty much done. Um, we use that for the lower valued accounts, uh, which is actually the majority of our accounts. And the personal property audits contingency TMA that was the one where we made about 160 grand, but that's that's winding down. So okay. we won't have we if we finish them all out by July, we may actually have nothing, you know, coming up next year. So we'll see what happens. I'm guessing we're going to have a little bit left. Okay. And that's the one you said we made 160,000. Is that the one where it, I mean, it, it says contingency right there. That's yep. where they get a third. Is that what they yep, get? 25, 25%. Okay. Yep. Does anybody have any questions for Fauna, the assessor? Just, just one on the uh, the property tax audits. Mm -hmm. How often would we do that? If it, you, you I would recommend every ten years. Um, it took three years to do them to do them all, you know. So there would be seven years, and then we'd start back up again if it's a program that we want to do again. I, I thought it was a good program. Um, and it didn't cost us anything if they didn't find anything, you know, it was beneficial to straighten out some accounts where maybe they were not declaring everything that they possibly should have been. We really have had no, you know, from my end here on our side, really not many people appealing the results, um, only a handful, you know, out of about 150. So that I thought was pretty good results. A lot of the ones in the past year ended up just being book audits. So if they declared it to, because they didn't want to do inspections during COVID. Um, at the start, they were doing inspections, but the ones this past year, they just did a book audit, had them turn over their books, their tax returns and stuff, and just did it that way. I still had some positives, so. Okay. There's... Councilwoman Peltier. Thank you. Um, I, I just have a question about the copy and binding, and I, I, because it appears that the whole forty five hundred is listed under business cards, but I'm assuming it's it's just not broken down into the all the other categories above it. Is that? Yeah, there's yeah, it's not broken down. So we every year we have to bind the grand list. I think copy and we gets provided to us by a vendor, but I believe that's a couple grand by itself. Um, and we have the personal property declarations that we have printed and mailed, um, the elderly applications. It's, we have a lot of printing we have to do internally as well. Um, that's what that's for. That's for all those categories above. I think there's one, two, three, four, five, seven things. Okay. And, um, and then I also have a question. Um, and this is a little off, but um, when the elections department was here at our last budget workshop, they mentioned they they wanted a, a LexisNexis account and mentioned that the assessor's office has an LexisNexis account um, and is we just sort of wanted to, but it, do, so do you guys use LexisNexis in your department? Um, whoever was speaking, it's the tax collector that she should have been saying, not the tax oh. assessor. I can oh, okay. see, I can see that happening, you know, <laughs> we're taxes and both. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but every, I came into work the next day and they're like, boy, Father, you were talked about last night a lot. <laughs> it's really what I do. Uh, no, um, so she okay. has, Marlene has LexisNexis and I think she okay. might have popped back on for you guys to answer that question if you need her for that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good point, Mary. I, I forgot about uh, that LexisNexis question from last week. So, so Marlene, you guys use LexisNexis in your office? Yes, we do. Um, it's very helpful. We found, you know, probably 80% of the returns I get, we find using LexisNexis. Um, I gave Carol the information for the contact that I use because I know she did come over and ask me about it. We've been using uh -huh. it for over 10 years. I only pay $1,500 a year because we're grandfathered in because I've had it so long. 
Um, but I understand that they're asking a little bit more for any newer clients. But couldn't you, what, I don't think that the um, elections department needs their own separate account. I was just wondering if, if, you know, the town of Wethersfield has an account that, you know, is your office uses, could you just, do you have any extra users available? I know they limit the number of, you, you know, account logins that you, you can have, but, or if you can add on an additional person, you know, that kind of thing. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I could check and see. They they give it to one. They gave it to me because they do a background check on you. So they ran me through all their systems, and I'm the one that has the ID, and the staff uses it. Um, we do help her, so we do look up things for her when she wants. Um, she probably could come in the office and use my extra computer and do it as well. It's limited to the ad, to the computers because they they're very secure. They track it. You know, it's comes out of my office. If we were to try to use it in another environment in the building, it would shut down. So she would be more than welcome to come into my office if she wanted to do that. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You need a background check to do background checks. So. <laughs> good. Uh, final question for Fauna. Um, what and I should probably know this difference between QDS software support and visions. What that should what actually be yeah. equality. Um, so QDS software support is our um, our admin software. That's where we run all the motor vehicles and the personal property and the real estate accounts. That's where we build them, kind of in a sense through. So our our admin accounts. We end up sending an upload, and then that converts over to Marlene's side of QDS to do the bills. Equality, it should be, that shouldn't be vision, it should be equality. Software maintenance, that's the program we use to value all our real estate. And yep. that runs that runs on its on its own on its own. It connects to these others, um, but that one's different. Got it. Okay, any other questions for Fauna or Marlene while she's still on at all? Good, okay, thank you. Thank you, have a good night. You too. Good night. We got Sue on. Mayor, I think you might have inadvertently missed uh, planning and Peter. So I don't know if you want to take him after Sue or. Oh, Peter. I mean, I did text him and say he must be all set and he can just move on. But I think he, he wants to present. I apologize for that. I go back. I, oh, we did. We did engineering and CIP. I thought we did bang, bang. But yeah, sorry about that. I didn't go back to my agenda. I am here if you'd like to take me now. Sure. Sorry about that. Peter. No problem. No problem. So uh, just for the record, uh, Peter Gillespie with the Planning and Economic Development Department. Uh, we're a small department. There's just two of us, Denise Bradley, our assistant planner, uh, and myself. We do uh, retain the services of a recording secretary to help us with some of our uh, meeting minutes. But uh, in essence, that's our uh, only staffing. Uh, you will notice in the proposed budget, we have added uh, an additional personnel line item uh, under salary and wages, and we've placed a $50,000 line item there. Uh, that request is based on um, some recent um, interest from the business community and from some residents who want to know what uh, progress uh, we are making on revitalization of the Silas Green Highway. The EDIC voted to add this line item to the budget uh, so that those funds could be used to retain either a part-time employee or a consulting service to help us refocus on uh, various initiatives along the Silas Green Highway. Um, there was quite a lengthy uh, set of conversations about that. Uh, and uh, based on our limited staff capabilities, it was felt that we needed to uh, put this in the agenda request, uh, budget request, and 
would be happy to discuss in, in detail what we had in mind. We think the position, uh, if we choose the right individual, would, would ultimately fund itself. Uh, part of that effort would be to uh, start working with the Connecticut DOT to talk about the Salestine Highway, uh, traffic improvements, and those kinds of things, and to pursue grant funding uh, as well that would help those efforts. Uh, we also think there's a need for a uh, potentially a business improvement district, uh, pulling together the property owners and the merchants into a sort of a cohesive force uh, to help us uh, implement that plan. So that's primarily the the biggest um, change in our budget from previous years is this additional um, resource that we could tap into to help us uh, in, in numerous numerous ways. Um, primarily, the rest of our line items, other than um, for the contractual obligations such as salary, insurance, and those kinds of things, have remained uh, in essence the same. Uh, I can go through the line items uh, for you. Uh, our copy and binding line item has stayed exactly the same. Uh, our travel training and dues is actually down $500. Uh, our professional services line item, I believe is up just $1,000. Our support service line item is looks like down $1,250. Uh, our office uh, machinery service is the same. Uh, let's see, our uh, public service contribution is the same. Our legal advertising line item is the same. And our general office supply line item is also the same. So as I said, um, the biggest uh, change in our proposed budget is this additional uh, personnel line item um, and uh, the other contractual obligations that are either union-based or uh, finance department-based. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I'm being brief, obviously, so that you can kind of get back on your, your timeline schedule, but I'd be happy to answer any of those questions. Councilman Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Peter, we just finished up uh, looking at a reduction uh, facade program, which I know you're very involved with, of $50,000 from CIP. Can you give us a feeling about where that $50,000 reduction came from? And if we were to um, reinstate the reduction, what would that go for? What, what, how would we be looking at you know, how that town would change with that type of investment? So our Facade program, uh, the maximum we can grant right now is $50,000 per project. We, um, in terms of accounting for what we have left, we have a, a little bit over $50,000 um, in our existing facade improvement program. Uh, we have a couple of projects on the horizon uh, that we will, even one of them will probably delete the program uh, from any kind of funding. So uh, the Masonic building uh, on Main Street is. Uh, being pursued by a brewery right now, uh, and he's looking for some assistance. And then we're talking to some folks about the uh, uh, Clearinghouse Falcon Gallery property on Church Street. Uh, so either one of those projects would probably delete uh, the funding in our facade program. Um, and I've tried to be conservative each year. I've either asked for 25 or 50, understanding that there are many needs in the community, but um, the CIP was uh, very supportive uh, of that uh, funding request when we did submit it. It looked like to us, there was $50,000 that was currently involved in there, but there was a $50,000 reduction. So the initial request was 100,000 that was reduced to 50. No, there was, there, there was a, there was a $100,000 request for the plan of conservation and development. And that was cut to, uh, it's in, and right now it's 50 with the idea that they would give us the uh, additional 50 next year. So we would have a two-year contract with uh, the consultant that we selected. And then there was another $50,000 line item for the facade program, and that was cut to zero. And that was cut to zero. So is it yeah. true, and Gary just struck me, that right now the facade $50,000 is out of the budget? That's true. Mike, I don't know if you have the cheat sheet up in front of you. A minute. And while he's looking for that, Peter, we'll try to efficiently use the time. 
the projects, especially the two that you talked about, but anything else on the horizon, would you be anticipating a need for more than $50,000 in the next fiscal year to handle, you know, good solid projects that you, that, you know, you think the, the committee deems worthy of the support? It's, it's hard to say. There's always projects that come uh, down the pipeline. Some we determine are not good, solid, and worthy of the funds. We've been very conservative uh, in uh, granting uh, funding on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it's hard to predict out uh, even more than a year, um, but we have had conversations with those two specific property owners, and that's uh, the primary reason I mentioned them uh, on, the, on the public record. So, yeah, but will those two uh, use up the 50 so that if any more under the normal course of business came through, we would have nothing left? Yes, that is very likely with those two projects um, that we will, we will potentially delete the, uh, the funding program. We just actually uh, denied one recently because we are uh, getting towards the bottom of the, of the funding barrel. So you say delete though, that anticipates that there's something already there and these two projects can go forward with it versus the $50,000 that we're looking at. Uh, we do have some funding right now uh, available to, to spend separate from the pending request. So we do have a little bit of money in the program. I think uh, depending on uh, who's doing the accounting that we have maybe a little bit over $50,000 now available to us. Okay, so you currently have 50,000 in there. If we add this back, that would be $100,000 total. Is that correct? That's correct. And then for at least the next two projects, is that enough for the two projects you're talking about and any additional projects? Or is that not enough for that? It's, it's hard to say since we haven't seen the, the pro formas and the, and the breakdowns of, of what they're proposing to do to the exterior. I think it would keep us in, in business for at least another year. And what, 100,000 would, or do we need more than 100,000? A hundred thousand dollars worth, yeah. Okay, and and Gary, is it true to say that? Well, I guess that there is fifty thousand currently left, but in this budget that we're allocating, that it's currently at zero, out zero additional dollars allocation. Is that correct? That is correct. There's not fifty thousand in there. There is a question of, is there flexibility? Um, not flexibility, but have we? gone through old outstanding and closed out to see if there's the availability of more than the 50,000 that's currently in there. And there may not be that much, but again, we have money from the federal government for infrastructure improvements that we're still waiting to find out what we can use on. So while well, there is somewhat of a risk and a gamble, um, uh, I believe there may be um, other opportunities. And um, how much would it, uh, the, the current 50, I think there's $50,000 in the budget for the additional part-time economic development director. If I'm, is that fair? Is that a fair sort of half title or is would, that not it fair? Would be economic development specialist or economic specialist. development coordinator. I mean, uh, we haven't really gotten into the, uh, the definitions yet, but uh, it would be someone who's gonna work specifically on economic development projects. And what would be the cost if it were turned into a full-time position? Uh, well, with benefits and, you know, we'd have to talk to the union and uh, it's hard, it's hard to, to say. Um, I mean, we're probably talking uh, 125 or 30. I'd probably defer to Mike O'Neill on, on that. But by the time you throw in, you know, benefits, insurance, and all the other associated things that go with that. So that's why the PDIC was uh, trying to lessen the impact of it, but at the same time, get somebody who can help and work specifically on these things. And then depending upon the success of that, we would discuss you know, whether it evolves into something else into, into the future years. By something else, do you mean a full-time position? Potentially, it really depends on the, you know, the success of the initiative and the kinds of projects and, you know, potential grants that get acquired and, and those kinds of things. Um, you know, this, this, the Silas Dean Highway uh, Improvement Program is a, is a large initiative and a, and a big undertaking. So um, once again, it depends on 
how successful this person is in, in moving some of those things along and how much additional time might be required to work on it. So how much, and I'm curious if it's, if it is a large undertaking, which certainly seems like it is, I'm concerned that putting someone in there part-time is, 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 is not enough force to see success. You know, it's kind of time to be someone's hands behind their back. Um, what is your thoughts on, on you know, a part-time economic developer for such a vast uh, improvement that we want to see with our town? Obviously, if the towns you know, uh, didn't have the budget limitations and challenges that it, that it has, we would have you know, probably been a little uh, more aggressive in terms of our, our ask, but the commission felt that uh, you know, this position will have to prove itself. And as it does that, we would come back and have those conversations uh, in, a, in a world with no limitations, we would clearly uh, ask you for a, another full-time position, but uh, given what's going on uh, with your budget challenges, we, we were respectful of that. Now would that person go hand in hand with some type of grant writing support? You did mention grant writing and it, in previous conversations, not in council, it seemed like that's a piece of the puzzle. Is that generally accurate? Uh, definitely, it's a, an important piece of what we would have this person work on, uh, particularly with uh, what's going on at the at the federal level right. and talks about infrastructure investments and those kinds of things. We want to have somebody who uh, has the time and is at the table uh, to hopefully take advantage of, of some of those things. We've made some initial outreach uh, to the DOT, um, and uh, we hope those conversations lead to uh, getting some more attention on, on the Silestine Highway. They are already looking at portions of uh, the Silestine Highway in Rocky Hill, so we want to uh, see if we can uh, evolve those conversations to focus uh, on us as well. What would a part-time grant writer cost? Is that the same as this part-time specialist or similar? Uh, it, once again, it's, it would probably be less than, than the, the 50 if it was just limited to, to grant uh, writing, but we, we don't envision this uh, position being limited to grant writing. We envision this position also meeting with property owners, uh, talking about getting the, the, shot, the, the merchants and the property owners organized in some way. We, we feel uh, revitalization of the highway corridor really requires the active engagement of all of the property owners and the merchants as well. So that uh, sure. can, can take a lot of time, a lot of meetings, a lot of phone calls, um, so it can eat up a considerable amount of time. I was thinking, as we talked about the hand-in-hand -hand relationship, symbiotic relationship between the grant writer and the, and the economic developer, and of course yourself, um, and the, the, the cost and value of that grant writer. Is that a, a part-time grant writer to go hand-in-hand, -hand, is that approximately $40,000? He said it was going to be a little less, and I have fifty thousand on the sheet. Is that generally accurate, Gary, or is there another sort of number out there? For, for a part-time grant writer? Yes. Just to do grants? Yep. It, it's kind of difficult to quantify that, simply because it depends upon what type of grants you're going for, right? So you can structure it where it's a percentage of the total amount you're going for. Um, it, it's it's really I mean if you're going to get someone talented just to write grants, you're better off putting someone kind of on a you know some sort of fee schedule. I, I you know it's it's really hard to just say you're a part-time grant writer for a municipality. It really Peter's logic is pretty sound in terms of okay this person has to do a number of different things. Also allows him to take some pressure off of um, some of the running around that he does. Um, we were talking about in addition to the specialist, Gary. So two part-time positions? I'm, I'm just asking, what is the what is the cost of a part-time position if it was in addition to the specialist? I'd really like to give that some thought. I mean, it's it's tough to pick up a, a part-time grant writer and say, okay, well, you're worth $40,000. They're usually when you do a part-time for that type of part-time position, they're doing a fee for service or some type of structure. Um, structured agreement. You know, if I get you a million dollars, I want 10% of the million dollars. If I get you, um, you know, X amount of hours to do this type of grant, and that's what I'm going to charge you for it versus I'm going to have you on staff and I, you know, you come in every day and, and go after grants. It, it's kind of, 
maybe I could be creative and try to come up with a number, but offhand, it's it's tough to pinpoint. Okay, maybe we could have a little conversation offline just to get a feel for what you're thinking about what budgetary impacts a position like that would take. Does that sound fair? Sounds good to me. Always up for having the conversation yep. for adding staffing. Okay. Thanks. Councilman Hill. Uh, thank you. And Peter, along those same lines, um, is, is there a goal or an expectation for this, um, this additional employee to essentially cover their own costs in terms of grants coming in or recruiting new businesses to put on our tax roll? Um, I guess, you know, I'm always a little hesitant when we're, all, when we're adding em employees, especially right now, in term, you know, budget season, um, because that's a cost that we carry moving forward. So, and I see that I, I, I'm a, I really do like the idea of really having someone to focus on these types of things to, to support, uh, to support you um, and really start bringing in, you know, just have more boots on the ground in order to get dollars in and um, more employers. in. So is there an expectation or a goal set by the town that this person will at a $50,000 or bring in you know, hundred thousand dollars worth of grants and two new businesses or, or is this something that it's more hopeful? Uh, we haven't, we haven't quantified it in, in those kinds of terms, but we are uh, contemplating that um, the $50,000 investment would uh, yield, you know, multi-time, you know, return on the investment. It wouldn't actually, the grants probably wouldn't pay the salary, but we think the uh, ancillary benefits, you know, would offset the, the investment of fifty thousand dollars. But we have not taken that to a, yeah. you know, a, a level of you know analysis that we we would yeah. you know I, be, it, be able to share with you. But we, we it would probably be be the kind of thing that somebody in that position would would ultimately have the time to be able to quantify. So at some point down the road, we could probably analyze that. Where I don't have the time. To do that kind of analysis myself at this point in time, uh, you know, we've done something like that for the facade improvement program, and you know, we've realized it returns an investment ten times the investment that we make. So we would probably be able to do something, but I, I, I hate to predict that now. And it'll and it will take time as well, you know, for the yeah. person to hit the ground running, you know, put the time in, track down the grants. You know, one year maybe, you know, just a small amount, but over time, one you know, significant grant would pay for it for, for a decade or more. So it, it's really hard to hard to have have that conversation at this time. And and just piggybacking off of Pete's comment, it's it you don't always you can't always immediately measure the tangible you know, you can measure the tangible but not the intangible. And a lot of the grants that someone like this may go after doesn't necessarily they're not they're revenue grants, right? They bring money in. They don't necessarily may not pay for a salary, but you have to look at, okay, I paid $50,000 and received $50 million worth of grants over a period of time. Um, and then you you have to kind of measure the, the residual effect that happens. So, you know, to Peter's point, it's, it's really tough to kind of structure it and say, well, you know, they're going to get $10 million worth of funding in here and, and Brownfield grants and, and um, you know, other community development programming and, and it's going to pay for their salary. It doesn't, it doesn't always work that way for these types of grants. And I appreciate that. And it is, uh, I, I'm sensitive to the fact that it is kind of an unfair question because I'm asking you to look into a crystal ball. Um, but I, I think we really need to kind of just, um, and to, just to talk about more because there's only, you know, there's only so much we can cut in every budget. We have um, you know, contractual obligations that increase every year. And I think an investment in terms of growing revenue is something we should really look at because a lot of our neighboring towns have this position. Um, and if we can find some sort of, I don't know, like analysis that says, you know, for every dollar you put in, you get a dollar fifty back. Or, you know, if Newington or Rocky Hill has this a similar um, position and that person has generated X amount of dollars in five years, you know, it might be something worthwhile for us to look at. And I, 
I was going to mention that both Rocky Hill and Glastonbury are both, you know, in the middle of significant uh, public improvement, public infrastructure projects on, on their main highway corridors, their main streets as we speak. And both of those were uh, funded, you know, through, uh, you know, efforts for people to track down funding and, and pay for that uh, so that the local taxpayers only had to spend a small matching uh, percentage of it. So those are the kinds of things that a person like this can really focus on uh, and bring that return you know, back to the community because the funding is out there. It's a matter of putting the time, you know, having a plan and then going out and pursuing that over a period of time. You know, the, the results aren't gonna be there in the first year or two, but over, over a longer period of time, um, you know, they, they, will, they will blossom at some point in time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions for Peter? Councilman O'Connor. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I'm just, um, I have to be honest, I'm a little confused here. Is and maybe I'm just misinterpreting it, but it sounds as if the ask is for more employees to be hired. And while that may be a great idea and a wonderful idea, if money was unlimited. The fact is I hear about these new positions being requested, but I've not heard one single mention of what are we gonna cut in order to afford it? Because the town can't afford it. It's as simple as that. You know, as council members, we take a sworn duty and oath to demonstrate fiscal responsibility. And I have to be honest, this budget to me, and it's not a reflection on the effort put into it, doesn't demonstrate that. As residents of the town, as, as, as elected members and appointed members of the town of Wethersfield, we're asking the, the residents of this Wethersfield on average to pay $560 and what, $60 more in taxes this year. This year, $560 more in taxes for the average household, which means many households are gonna be paying a lot more than that. These are the same households that he had uh, have had lost jobs, lost wages, way, uh, hours cut back. They've had um, bonuses withheld because the employer was just trying to stay alive. And when I look at all the surrounding towns we have around us, Newington, Rocky Hill, South Windsor, Windsor, Middletown, Glastonbury, every one of them is coming in flat or even less than zero. Every one of them has a mill rate under 40. And our mill rate is comparable to New Haven, New Britain, uh, uh, Bridgeport, East Hartford. I mean, that's just ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And then to sit here and say, let's add another position on, well, we can't even afford the ones we have. I mean, I would be all ears for adding more to economic development because I do believe, as Kevin and even Matt said, in the long run, it is in the best interest of the town of Wethersfield. And I would ask the same question, Kevin, you said, with regards to if we spent 50, do we get 100,000 in business or what? I mean, it, that to me is a logical question. The reality though, is if we're gonna spend money, we've got to take it from somewhere else. And the only other place we have to take it is from the people we're now charging another $560 in the worst possible time you could ever do that. And so my attitude is we shouldn't be talking about adding new positions. You should be talking about what we can eliminate so that we can come in at a budget that is reasonable and reflective of the times and of our surrounding communities. And our budget right now doesn't do that. And so when I'm hearing the concept of adding someone, well, where's the concept of then, what are you gonna take away? So there's a net zero cost. And so that's a conversation I'd love to have because I'm just confused. I apologize for my rant. All valid points, but we can definitely have further discussion on that. I mean, kind of going off of what Councilman Hill had said, you know, if there's a um, investment and in return, return of investment on this, then, you know, maybe something we can consider, um, you know, just looking at some of the other part-time positions that other departments have, I think the highest one I saw was at 23,000. They average around 16, 17, 19,000. For part-time positions so yeah i don't see this as a a, a part-time truly part-time position i mean at, at fifty thousand dollars i really would hope that we get as much bang for our bucket 
uh, $50,000 for a part-time position. You know, and part of, you know, I'm not gonna put you on the spot, Peter, but part of your actual role, portion of that is for economic development as well. So, I mean, we are, we are looking at part of Peter's salary and part of this, if we do hire a part-time um, economic development person, you know, we might not be at 50%, we could be at 75% or something. I don't foresee Peter losing any of his responsibility and his role as part economic development person in this town as well. Yeah, and then these, I guess, yeah these, these, these um, responsibilities would be above and beyond my normal responsibility. So my um, uh, level of... Uh, uh, time spent on economic development would not decrease. It's not to offset my time. It's to add add to our efforts. Right. Right. In essence, I'm not. I'm not thinking we're we're on economic development in, in your office at just fifty percent. You know, we still have your your role in there as well. Um, I guess a question for either Mike O'Neill or for Gary: Does this part time position come with uh, um, benefits at all? Do they, as a part-time position? Nope, no benefits included in this one. Straight $50,000 salary. I mean, we would negotiate, but yeah, um, up to, up to $50,000 made available for a part-time employee. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I have a Peter? quick question. I, I have a question. Um, going back to the facade loan program, in the past, was that program funded by grants or? It's yeah. always, yeah, from its uh, inception back in 2005, it's been funded uh, off and on through grants as well as uh, the capital improvement program. We've also had some uh, loans that uh, repaid uh, us and those monies were funneled back into the program. Um, somewhere I have a breakdown of you know, how much was town funding and how much was, um, was state grant funding. But um, uh, so I can, if you, if you like that breakdown, I can certainly get it to you, but it's always been a, a combination of both of those sources of funds. Okay. I do think it's a good program. I mean, I, I like a lot of the changes I've seen along Silas Dean. So um, I'm just trying to think if there's other ways to fund it. Uh, and I wonder if we can use some of that federal money that we have coming in. I know we still don't have guidelines, but that might be something to think about. Thanks. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Mary. Any other questions for Peter on this? Okay, definitely a lot to digest on economic development and hopefully some of these things that are in the works will come to fruition on it. Okay, now let me go back to the agenda so I don't skip anybody else. <laughs> now we have uh, Sue, is Sue on? Hello. Hi, Sue. How are you? Good. How's everybody? Good. It's like a council meeting. We're an hour and a half oh. into this. <laughs> yep. Uh, two and a half hours in, but it's an hour and a half into a typical council meeting. Okay. So tonight I'm here to talk about uh, the budget for the town clerk's office. And our office has um, three people, one uh, part-time and two full-time. So... Um, we have the copying and binding has um, stayed the same. And the uh, travel and training has also stayed the same. And uh, last week, we were able to go to a virtual conference in the office. So all three of us participated, um, which is great so that we're kept up to date on the newest changes. Um, there's a new death certificate coming and so there's a lot of um, changes going to be made there, but it's important to keep up with those things. Um, professional services has increased. 
um, and that is due to the increase in the volume of land records. Um, the legal abstract, it's um, mandated by the state to have all the land records, each one um, audited. And so um, based on the amount of land records that we've had, um, it comes to about 450 per month. Um, so that's going to increase because we've had so many, it's almost, um, Well, that's just going to increase due to the volume of land records. And the same is with the storage. Um, currently, we have to keep microfilm for all of everything that's been microfilmed in the vault, but that increases each year. And that goes also, um, we have to have them microfilmed as we get them. So that's also increasing. Um, machinery has stayed the same and um, legal advertisement has increased. Um, I tried to go back over the last two um, mun municipal elections just to go over what we spent for um, each fiscal year for legal advertisement and um, that was uh, what I came up with the average of the two years or the two, you know, the two um, municipal cycles. And then the um, specialized agency supplies also has increased because we're using so much paper and going through volumes um, where before we were completing a 1200 page volume in three to four weeks. Now we're completing them in two to three weeks. Um, the last volume we finished last week, we finished in 13 days, which was it's crazy. Um, and general office supplies has stayed the same. And that's all I have. Thank you, Sue. Any questions for town clerk? Well, I'll ask you at this juncture, I've been meaning to ask a lot of other folks about legal advertisements. Mm -hmm. What is the requirement to uh, advertise in the newspaper? Does it have to be a circular, you know, read by so many people in town? Yes, and we used to advertise in the Hartford Current, but then we changed to the Rare Reminder because it was um, significantly uh, less expensive. So um, it's got to be some place where you know, people see it. Okay. And it has to be in a newspaper. Can it be digital? Uh, does it have to be in a print newspaper? Can um, it be I on? Can, I'll check into that and get back to you. So okay. I can give you the specific answer. I'm just thinking all these departments have legal requirements to advertise any kind of legal notices. Just wondering, you know, I know it's a mandate from the, the state that we have to broadcast them. I just don't know if it has to be in, you know, newsprint or if we can do it through our own town website. Yeah, and unless it's changed, there's a number of restrictions the state still hasn't removed. Um, and by change, I mean in the last, I'll say, 18 months to two years that you electronic is not the only way you're allowed to do it, that you actually have to post it in a newspaper of general circulation or whatever the actual mm -hmm. uh, is with something similar. That doesn't mean we can't use um, other means, but it has to be, um, it, it has to be kind of a common, common access. But we'll research it just to make sure that I didn't miss a, a change in the, in the rules and the statute. Maybe if we could have Mike compile from each department what our cost for legal advertising through a common circulation would cost or is costing us. Can that be done, Mike? Yes, for sure. 
kind of not going to save us much. Just more discussion on mandates for municipalities. I'm sorry, Dan, you have a question? I, no, I was just saying it seems counterintuitive to the Go Green initiatives that we're going to go out and do stuff in print. I mean, every company in North America is forcing people to do stuff electronically. I mean, we could post that stuff on Access TV. Everybody has access to that, probably more so than the print. But I mean, I know if the law is a law, you can't do anything about it, but it does seem counterintuitive when even the state is having to do stuff online now. Right. Definitely something discussed. I really don't know. I mean, even though it's not, maybe not in this current room, rareminder.com. Okay. Any other questions for Sue? Well, I just have a quick question. I just wanted to know if we have filled the assistant town clerk position. Yes. We, okay. I just, yes, we have. Okay. Thanks. Uh, we followed our, uh, the union rules related to that position. We had to post it internally for five days. We had um, a number of candidates apply uh, that were extremely talented and a tough decision was made. And we picked a very talented individual, um, which means of course, because we had an internal candidate, now we'll have another position to post. So, which Marlene already talked about. Okay. Um, so I just have one question. Okay. Um, you mentioned that you're, you've increased for the specialized agency supplies. Um, is, is that like fraud waste? Like, is that something that's like, it's just not being monitored, monitored as much and that's why it's being used so much? Like you said that the printing just accelerated. Is there a reason oh. why? Um, well, all the land records, you know, we're doing all the um, refis and home sales. So um, it's just the amount of documents that we're taking in has increased. So, um, you know, where we were just making, completing a 1200 page book in a month, three weeks to a month, now we're filling one up in two to three weeks instead. So it's just going along that much faster. I printed the documents today from Friday and today, and there were over 300 pages. Um, so um, it, it just, it goes so fast. The recordings just haven't stopped coming. All in. right, so I must've just misunderstood you earlier. Okay, so okay. The, the three time increase is, is just aligning with what is happening right now. Yes, okay. but, and the only good thing about that is that we're taking in more conveyance tax, um, you know, so that's that's the upside there. Got it. I just, you know, when I see numbers that triple, I just got a question, why is it tripling or doubling? Okay, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. No, you're fine, it was probably just me. Okay. Sue, that's specialty paper, right? That's not just- Oh, it is, absolutely. It's archival paper, so, um, that also we have to use certain paper because it's, you know, supposed to last forever and uh, be kept in the vault. So um, that's why it's expensive. Councilman Biggs brought up a good point with conveyance tax. Um, how are we looking with conveyance tax? I mean, Home sale uh, inventory is down. All the realtors are telling me uh, houses are selling pretty quickly. Um, house values are up. Sale prices are up. Uh, comparable? Do you have a comparable for last year on conveyance tax, or is that for Sue or um, Marlene? I don't have it um, ready right now, but I can look at it and. And okay. To the numbers. If you don't mind, provide sure. that. Great. That'd be good to know. Okay. Any other questions for Sue? Hearing none, we're good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a good night. You too. John, I see you down there for Townwide Radio.
Can everybody see me? Yep. Hello, good evening. How y'all doing? Uh, my name's John. I haven't met most of you. My name's John Eichner. I'm the town's uh, communications consultant. I'm actually a part-time contract employee. I work about 20 to 24 hours a week. Um, my responsibilities include managing the town's radio system, which is the largest proportion of my time, uh, doing uh, telephone work, uh, managing the, the existing PBX, working on the replacement VoIP over IP uh, RFP, working on that, uh, do some cell phone work. And the smallest portion of my responsibilities include managing the town's two radio towers, own, the, the towers that the town owns. That's at the PD and at uh, 23 Kelleher Court, Fire Company 3. We also have radio towers, two other radio sites, in one in Newington and one in, on top of uh, Executive Square that the town leases from other owners. So we own two towers, and I'll talk a little bit later about uh, the towers themselves, so what's going on lately in the world with uh, cell providers and, and spend a few minutes on that. Um, I can fly through my budget because there's not really much that changes as a, at all. Uh, the, the minor increases are in the Harris maintenance contract um, and that's based on a, uh, a table that is in the contract that was signed uh, well, well over six years ago. The, the town's radio system is actually six years old. It was installed and activated on January 6th, um, six years ago, 2015. Um, it was accepted well over two years later. We made the final acceptance. We had some of you who were around are aware of some of the uh, problems we went through in, in implementation, uh, but Final acceptance was made two years later in, in April. Um, so the, the system being six years old now, it will be seven in the middle of next year. Um, what I'm asking the town manager to do is, is I'd like to get Harris in here. Harris is the uh, manufacturer of, this, of the system um, and have them make some proposals or some presentations on a system upgrade. The thinking is that this system is now, well, will be seven years old in the middle of next year. Um, we are operating a system that is uh, 10A.0. It's the software level of the, the primary system. Harris is marketing 10A.4. So four minor upgrades over the last four years. There's at least four or five features that I'm aware of. There could be more that are available now that weren't available when the town bought the system. I'll spend a couple minutes talking about some of those. One of them is OTAP, which is over the air programming. Instead of bringing a radio in, you can just push it out over the air. Another one is a feature called RUMS, Remote User Monitoring Service. Um, there's a little bit of controversy about this service. It allows a dispatcher to open a mic uh, when he or she does not hear from a, a, a radio owner and operator for a while and try to listen in on that. There's some privacy concerns that obviously some of the uh, police and firefighters have on this, but it's an issue, it, it, it's, a, it's a feature we wanna take a look at anyway. Um, another one is called Presence. The radios that we use gather GPS data, but we don't have the software uh, to do anything with it. We don't know what's happening with that GPS data. Presence is a software component added onto the system that will allow us to do something with the GPS data. Um, there's a, a fourth feature that I'm aware of. It's something called a distributed control point. Our Harris system has essentially two brains, an A and a B, and we can switch between the A and a B whenever we need to. So it's a redundant system for the most part. However, there is one single point of failure where we're not redundant, it, redundant. And that is the control point it, itself, which says go to A or go to B brain, use one or the other. Harris in the last few years has introduced uh, something called uh, 
distributed control point, which allows us to, to, to make the system more fully redundant. Uh, so we'd like to take a look at that too. And, and finally, there's a feature LTE, which is to those of you familiar with the telecom industry, LTE is essentially what's used for cell phones. Uh, the, the marriage between cell phones and, and land mobile radios is coming down the pipeline. One of the, you may have, some of you may have heard of something called FirstNet, which is the nationwide first responders network that is being developed nationally uh, by AT&T. Um, FirstNet will use LTE. Uh, Harris is now putting LTE service in its portables. So we'd like to look at that and see where that will fit in in the future um, in a consolidated instrument. So there's there's four, five, six, maybe more components or, or not components, uh, features and functionalities that have been introduced in the six years since, since Harris, the system was installed. Uh, we'd like to have a look at that. And here's the bottom line on that. When this system was bought six years ago, it was life spanned for 20 to 25 years. If the town doesn't upgrade in the next few years, we can essentially reset that clock, start another 20 to 25 year lifespan. So it's something we wanna look at and evaluate. There's no decisions to be made, obviously, until, until we fully vet it, but uh, we wanna bring Harris in and look at system upgrade. Um, let me take a step back and talk a few minutes about FirstNet. FirstNet, uh, there's been, the, the town looked at actually moving to FirstNet, AT&T from our, uh, right now FirstNet is, is only on cell phones, essentially. It will be merged with radios in the future. But we looked at moving over to AT&T for the cell phone service to prepare ourselves. There were a lot of problems about two years ago when we looked at it. Um, we wanna take another look at FirstNet sometime in the next year and see whether it's advantageous for the town to move its cell service over to FirstNet as well. Um, the, the radio system, has been operating on a, on a ex, certainly an acceptable and some would say a, a very good performance level over the past several years. It's been rock steady. We've had some issues with, um, well, we had an issue within the last year on a generator issue uh, that caused some uh, an outage for a couple hours. But other than those few hours, we have not had any downtime at all. In fact, uh, last couple of days, we had a, a, a fiber break in town. Um, I don't know if you, you heard about that in, in the uh, IT services uh, conversation last week, but um, fiber break uh, caused the loss of internet service, but it did not result in any damage or, or loss of service in the, in the radio system. The radio system does use the, the town's fiber network for backhaul, but it is backed up by redundant microwave links. Uh, when the fiber break occurred, the system failed over uh, seamlessly to uh, microwave. Nobody knew what had happened. So um, there are redundancies built within the system. Uh, certainly that, that, that's a necessity for public safety, um, but there are more coming down the line and we'll, we'd like to look at that. Uh, before I move on to cell tower management, does anybody have any questions regarding the, the radio system right now? I guess my only question, John, you have a new line item of 5,000 for Eastern communications. Yeah. Let me explain what that's about. Um, Eastern is the um, maintenance shop that is affiliated with Harris. In fact, Eastern staff did the install subcontracted from Harris initially um, and I've had five thousand dollars well I haven't had five thousand dollars I had a couple of thousand dollars that I squeezed out of the maintenance budget and set aside for Eastern um, we had two new fire apparatus delivered to the town this year and, and uh, um, Sutton was not capable of installing the, the, the mobile radios in those two pieces of equipment so I had to bring Harris, I, I mean, 
I had to bring Eastern techs in uh, three days, uh, two men. Uh, so uh, total of 48 hours work and it cost me over $10,000 that I had not budgeted. It, the result of that is that I ended up having to postpone this year. One of the things I had budgeted in the current year was uh, HVAC upgrades and we decided consultation with Mike that uh, we're gonna forego the HVAC units to pay for that. Um, so I, I figured it'd, wa it'd be wise at this point to put $5,000 a year aside for unforeseen contingencies such as that. Um, if, if there's, let's say there's, uh, the, the town staff does the regular police cruisers, uh, electronic equipment, including the mobile radios. But if there are two or three or four vehicles that go down at the same time and we need to supplement the town staff to get those mobile radios installed in, in fire and police equipment, I'm going to have to call Eastern in to do that. So that's what that's about, is to have that money available um, for non-maintenance, non-contract work uh, by Eastern qualified uh, certified staff. Does that answer your question? Ms. It Mayor? does. Yep. Yep. All right. Let me let me talk a couple of minutes about cell towers. The two that the town owns at the PD and at the fire company three. Um, uh, you may or may not be aware of consolidation in the cell phone industry over the last few years. The mergers. Nextel was bought out by Sprint a couple of years ago. Uh, within the past year, Sprint was bought out by T-Mobile. Um, so. What that does is number one, it, it drives the prices of rental down. We, we had a neg tough negotiation with one of our uh, cell providers that whose contract ran out. Um, there, we have uh, 15 and, and 30 year contracts with the providers, but one of the 15 year contracts ran out and they demanded a, uh, a steep discount in the a new contract. Uh, we negotiated most of it back or not most of it. I think we split, basically split the difference to get them to re-up for another 15 years. But with the consolidation of vendors in the market, the uh, rental is going down. Um, now, with the merger of Sprint and T-Mobile, um, we have both Sprint and T-Mobile at one of our sites uh, and I anticipate within the next year sometime, I don't know when, we haven't been told, that Sprint will go down. We'll, they'll shut down their sites and rely totally on, on the T-Mobile network. Uh, that will cost the town some revenue at, at one of our sites. That's the bad news. The good news is there is finally a new vendor in the market. Dish Network is building out a cellular telephone network, and they've approached the town, and they'd like to buy space on our tower at the PD. So whatever we may lose from uh, Sprint shutting down, we may get back uh, from uh, the DISH network expansion or build out. Um, and do we have AT&T uh, at Kelleher Corp? Um, yes, we do. We do not have AT&T at the PD because they have their own tower at uh, in the central office down on um, not Church Street, it's uh, down right in the middle of town is where the central office is, is the tower. But we do have them up at Kelleher. Yep. Okay. And we receive rental from them? Yes, we do. In fact, AT&T built that tower for the town um, 20 some odd years ago and was given five years free rent um, and then turned over the asset, turned over ownership of the tower itself to the town after the five years. So that's what's going on with the cell towers. Um, now, there, there is one other issue that I did not ask Mike not to put in the narrative for the town-wide radio budget, but I would like to discuss with you a little bit. And that is that we are in negotiations with Hartford to have them come and share space in, in our Kelleher site. Um, Hartford operates an analog. It's a 30-year-old Harris system. It's called EDAX. It's an analog system. Ours is digital. 
Um, Hartford system is well overdue for an upgrade and they're trying to find the money to do it and, and doing it piecemeal. If they expand or if they upgrade their system, uh, what they will do is go to a multi-site system, just as we have multi-sites, we have three sites for our system, they will have three sites. We've offered them space at Kelleher. Um, it, it, several advantages, it, it's well-placed for them uh, strategically, it, it covers the south part of Hartford, but it puts Hartford's radio system presence in one of our radio shelters, gives us the ability to then connect with them um, and interoperate with them. We can, we can pick up their signal, they can pick up ours a lot, a lot easier than having to pay uh, microwave or fiber links to get to each other's systems. Um, the negotiations is going on is we've offered them space in our existing shelter at no rental cost, but they would share the cost of any upgrades. Uh, we budget for uh, UPS replacements and HVAC units. They would split those costs with us if they came in and shared you know, the, uh, the capital expenditures with us. Uh, the alternative is they could rent a vacant shelter that we have at Kelleher, the town's old shelter. When we put the Harris system in, we moved into a vacant Nextel and, and we abandoned our old shelter. Um, it all depends, the, the, the critical factor here is how much rack space they need. If they need three or four racks, they can fit into our shelter. If they need five or six racks, they may need more space and have to rent it. But their engineers are, are reviewing that now and, and we'll, sometime within the next year, we'll, we'll figure out where they're going, whether they're gonna share space with us in our shelter or whether they're gonna rent space in our vacant shelter. But that's going on, it's a, it's a cooperative arrangement. Um, we're working to help each other out. Um, and I think it'll be very, uh, certainly the police and fire chiefs both support this move. Um, and, I, and as does the city manager, if I may speak for him, uh, the town manager, if I may speak for him. Um, so those are the three items that I did want to touch on, the, the, the system study, the, the cell towers, and the Hartford negotiations. Um, everything else is uh, basically, as I said, uh, carried forward. We, we've changed some of the, uh, re, the uh, specialized equipment supplies. Uh, one year we'll buy a couple of mobile radios. Next year, we buy some uh, um, portable radios. Uh, in, the, in the coming year, I want to buy a couple of uh, control stations to allow us to have better communications with both Rocky Hill and Newington, put their systems into our shelters, and then we can uh, better communicate with them. Uh, but that's about, that's about all that's going on. It's, it's basically keeping the system operating and keeping it up to date. Any other questions? Boring, huh? <laughs> Mike, is there anything else that I missed that you, you could think of? Or? John, can you just cover if, if we're I'll wait to make sure we're done with townwide radio. I just got one question, Mike, if I could. Or maybe I missed it. What is the CMED contribution and it's like blacked out? We don't need it anymore? No. I did not put it in my spreadsheet because I don't pay for that. That comes directly through finance. So I, I did not enter it and it just got by us. Um, finance staff is, was, is going to plug that back in. That's the that's the item that I mentioned the other oh, night. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's twenty. It's twenty three thousand. The full disclosure item. I caught you. You were in a good mood when I brought it up, because I think I found some money for you. It was premium or something. I'm always in so, a good mood. That that uh, <laughs> this is true. Um, yeah, that, that, that I, I apologize again. That this budget it gets handled by a couple different people myself and john and then you know just it just 
things move fast at the end when you're putting the book together and it, it, we didn't pick it up. Well, what, what is CMED though, Mike? What, that is, is uh, John, is it medical dispatch? CMED is the regional medical dispatch. Um, and I didn't do anything with it specifically because I wasn't sure where the town stood. I know there was some talk a couple of years ago about uh, bailing out of the CMED arrangement. Um, and I wasn't sure. And that's one of the reasons why I didn't touch that line item. Okay, yeah, thank you. There was a piece of it that we did withdraw from, but it's a, it's a regional um, group based in Hartford. I think it's actually based out in Farmington, the, where they have their operations. But it's for the Hartford region, yeah. Yep. Central, it's uh, Central, C is stands for Central. There's E meds and N meds and other things around the state. Okay. John, you want to jump to uh, just cover the telecom budget that's in central office? I, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, I can talk uh, to it. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me pull it up. Uh, everybody see that? Yeah, I think um, for the most part, that's pretty much status quo. We're, we're leaving things um, as they are. I, I know there's been some increases um, in the last year or two, particularly in cell phone usage and, and the number of cell phones. We added a bunch of cell phones, I think six or eight uh, for COVID. Um, we needed to have uh, cell phones available for people who are working at, out of their own homes. So that, that line item would have been going up over the last few years. Um, again, we've been working for two plus years on, on, a, on a VoIP system. Uh, we've had delays because of um, prerequisites that have to be addressed. Uh, network system upgrades, uh, firewalls, uh, wiring projects that needed to be completed so that we would be in a position to move forward with the, the uh, VoIP system. But uh, we're hoping to get that out pretty soon. I'm not gonna make any comments on when because every time I promise it to somebody, uh, we miss that deadline. So we're moving on it though. We're working on it. John, no, no increases though in the, the frontier, which is where we pay for most of our- Not to, yeah. That's pretty stable. Yep. Um, we have an item here, which are, which is our maintenance contract for the current phone system, which yes. is- uh, Well, that's, um, yes, that's maintenance on the current PBX. And we've had to use that. We've had to call on that a couple of times over the last few years. And we've had uh, mostly power outages that have caused that system to go down. <laughs> um, we had one this past year, which came on a, uh, result of a storm and a power outage uh, that tr actually blew right by our uh, UPS and caused some damage. Fortunately, it happened on a Friday night and we had techs in um, Saturday during the day and, and nobody was the wiser on Monday morning because it was back up and operating. But this the system was down for over 24 hours, the, the phone system over the weekend. Uh, that's the, the maintenance contract for coverage with AT&T to AT&T maintains a portfolio, even though they sold uh, most of their business to Frontier, AT&T does maintain PBX equipment still. It, it retained that part of their portfolio. So that's contract with AT&T. Looks good. Status quo on the phone side, yeah. Until we till we put that, we think that um, the operating expenses will be pretty much the same. Uh, we'll we'll change some trunking features when we put in a VoIP system. Um, we'll change um, the the fax service. 
we, uh, fax does not work well over a VoIP system. So we've had, that, that's another uh, delay uh, item that caused somewhat of a delay. We've had to research how to address uh, the continuation of fax service. The town has about 19 fax lines in service now. Um, and we'll probably keep that, uh, that number. Um, so we had to uh, come up with a solution for faxing when we replaced the phone system as well. Maybe we can do an inventory on how many uses of the fax machine we actually use. I, I tried that. I, I sent out an email to all, all departments that, that have fax machines. Um, and it was, uh, the response was not 100%, but uh, it was varied. Some used it daily, multiple times. Others don't use it a lot. Uh, if we can consolidate and get rid of some of them, I'd be glad to do that. Um, uh, town, town clerk was one where I thought, well, they don't use it, but they do. They're one of the uh, state agencies that they deal with will not accept anything other than facts. They, the state agency is not equipped to get electronic transmission, so they need to keep a fax line in for, for that purpose. Um, there are other ones out there, but uh, I did try to get some. This is a question for off the record uh, conversation, but couldn't we just use, you know, couldn't somebody in Sue's office go over to the town clerk's office across the hall and just use that fax machine? Um, I can't answer that for her. I don't know what the yep. um, privacy requirements may or may not be for, for what they're faxing. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, let's have a conversation on that and see what the cost is to have these lines out there. Uh, also, just looking at phone uh, lines, I don't know, John, you don't have it in front of you, but Mike does. We have Frontier, AT&T, AT&T, Verizon, Verizon. I mean, can we consolidate any of those? Can we begin to look at consolidating some of those for a lesser cost? I mean, mobile phone services at 42.5, mobile device services at 15. Uh, can we look to get a better deal from Verizon because we have both of those through them that maybe we could save some money? Uh, I'll do try a, to explain uh, that one a little bit. Um, we one we of the do a quarterly review with the rep from Verizon Wireless. They're in a st state contract. Yes. So we've, we've got, uh, I think we got, John, two data pools and we kind of manage users between the two data pools. So we, we've yeah. actually, the reason that stayed stable, you know, despite the fact that we've had add, added devices, you know, um, we limit the addition of devices, but, but they just, you know, the need continues to grow. But despite the fact that we've added devices, um, you know, we've kept that, kept that pretty stable because we're, we're looking at that every quarter with the, with the rep. The, the, the first gotcha. of those, okay. uh, the first of those two Verizon accounts is for cell phones themselves. The second is for iPads. Um, so we have actually two accounts. We do get a pretty good rate. In fact, when we were entertaining the uh, AT&T proposal for FirstNet a year and a half or so ago, uh, Verizon responded by coming up with a new public safety plan that actually cut most of our uh, smartphone users in public safety departments. Uh, they gave us a better rate. Um, so they responded and, and, and that helped keep the, uh, the expansion down as well. And I take it that for the iPhones or uh, uh, iPads, is that for data that's used? Yes, yes, and that's all pooled. And, okay. I guess it's not a question for tonight, but maybe something to think about. I did hear that because we are, everybody's working remote, people are using data more on their iPads. I just wonder if there's an announcement that goes out to staff and those that use the iPads that when you're using them, try to log on to any local Wi-Fi rather than strictly, I mean, I, I just wonder if, like we look at that. I look at those bills every month, 
and we flag people and we send those okay. messages out and make sure they're using Wi-Fi. And I will admit, I think I got called out on one of them because I may have not <laughs> turned on the Wi-Fi on my iPhone or iPad. Oh, I think you did for, for meetings. <laughs> for a couple meetings. Well, that was before I upgraded to uh, better bandwidth. This was actually working better. You can take it out of the town council budget. Okay, John, I think we're good. Okay. Thank you for your time and have Appreciate a good evening. It. Always insightful. Does anybody need to take a five minute break at all before Gary comes back on and comes on? Well, let me rephrase that. Let me take a two minute break before Gary comes on.
Okay. I think we can probably start back up. Should I start? Sure. We right. need to have these back at the fireside room where we eat and drink coffee. I don't remember if last year did we actually or two years ago if we provided it? It seems so long ago. Um, I mean, I'm stuck in the office, yeah. so I can make, I can make coffee, grab water bottles. It's, it's fine. It was um, dinner. COVID. I'm not mistaken. All right, do we have enough council members today? Oops, hold on. I think we got everybody. One, two, three. Yep. All right. So uh, town manager's budget, town manager's office is responsible for directing the day-to-day -day operations of the town. Uh, that includes the human resource functions, um, and I introduced Claudia earlier, uh, related to all non-Board of Education um, HR functions, that is. Uh, we're normally staffed at three and a half full-time equivalents. This year, we did limp along for uh, at two, myself and Cheryl Pierce. I want to thank Cheryl Pierce and Mike O'Neill, who became overnight HR managers uh, working as a team to solve the problems for the more than 200 um, current employees and I don't even know how many retirees um, that were receiving calls, um, just kind of ongoing immediate needs and assistance required on a daily basis. Um, Cheryl did her best to triage, answer what she could. Some things had to go to Mike, some things went to me, some things uh, a lot of heavy weight fell on her. Um, meant that metaphorically no one dropped a weight on her because that would be um, that would be an issue related to uh, workers comp and then she'd have to fill out her own paperwork for workers comp. So just to give you some highlights of all the things that took place on the HR side um, other than the day-to-day -day operations and the town managers HR we successfully negotiated three contracts the third is coming to you for ratification next month um, we're currently working on an, an additional three. I'm glad to say that I'm going to resume my position in those, which is I typically um, have some leverage as a good cop, bad cop, right? So the HR manager and or department and or the labor attorney will work together through the negotiation component and they might come to me to run things off of me or if I need to be the heavy, I'll be the heavy. Uh, but for the most part, I'm looking forward to Claudia handing that back over uh, to the HR department, so enjoy. Um, hopefully we'll have those completed prior to June 30th. Um, if not, they might spill over into July. We're just really starting the process with two of them and the third we haven't had a chance to start with. Um, but they are, they are due, they are due uh, June 30th, uh, 2021, their contract expires. So we need to get those in place. Uh, during the last year we negotiated, I think I counted approximately 11 grievances came our way. Um, those 11 did not go to a mediation, which means we satisfactorily came to some kind of conclusion or middle ground or common understanding. And then we had uh, two that are possibly going to either mediation or an arbitration. Those are pending. Um, my personal opinion is one of them will be able to settle in mediation. Uh, the other one will probably go to an arbitration process, but we'll see how it goes. Um, I think uh, my last look, we did approximately 38 recruitments to date um, for positions that were vacant or turned over. And uh, more than 403 applications were reviewed as part of those 38 recruitments. Just to give you an example, uh, last year we did 34 or 36 recruitments. Um, so we did more this year with more applications reviewed without an HR manager. And it wasn't easy because we still had to do the work. Cheryl still had to do what she needed to do. Um, she was the main person working with 
uh, recruitments. And she worked with department heads. I obviously can't take away from the other staff within the departments who helped with her, but a lot of that heavy lifting fell on her. And I, I really just need to compliment her and thank her for all that work. Uh, part of that was also FMLA paperwork, um, uh, workers' compensation issues, employment and pension issues. Mike, uh, I ran into one of the police officers who retired in the past year and uh, in the supermarket over the weekend, and he had commented and complimented Mike O'Neill saying, I'm pretty sure I was the first um, full employee retirement pension issue he had to deal with at that level. Um, and they worked through it together. And um, so just an excellent job. Multiple employee health insurance issues, uh, as we've previously discussed um, the other night when we were talking about health insurance and things that were going on with, it, with our current uh, provider. Um, but also upcoming enrollments, um, advocacy that we needed to do on behalf of employees and general analysis of how our spending was. A lot of term, um, not a lot, um, some terminations along the way, ongoing drug testing, spot testing, um, OSHA safety training, um, and just uh, employee-wide training that needed to be completed per state statute that was kind of thrown on us with deadlines that were unexpected. Uh, general compliance, background checks, risk management, you you name it, we still continued to do it, uh, despite being down uh, a staff member who could do it. However, things were uh, pushed aside, right? Our response rate slowed down for ongoing um, and necessary things within departments, but I thank um, my staff for being patient and working with me and understanding what we we're going through. Um, not to mention the ongoing challenges of COVID with regulations that changed what felt like multiple times a day, um, handling quarantines, testing requirements, and those endless policy changes. So thank you for all that work. Uh, now on to the budget. If we start with the salaries and wages, and uh, unlike some of what other the, some of the other department heads did, rather than going line by line, I'm going to just isolate the ones that I can see quickly that are changes and we can go back and we can touch upon any, any one that you want to talk about. Um, the total change for salaries and wages essentially stayed even from last year. Um, much of that is driven by the turnover in staffing and again welcoming our new HR manager to fill that spot. Um, other than gross wage increase requests uh, the other driving factor is an added $3,000 in the emergency operations coordinator stipend. Um, based on the workload that these two positions have done over the last year um, and looking at comparably sized municipalities and what um, the types of programs that they're running, we're looking to increase those stipends by about $125 per month or $1,500 each. Um, uh, to cover costs, this uh, to uh, to cover their costs. This is again based not only on the past 12 months with COVID, but also increases that we're seeing. There's new safety plans, expected trainings that we're looking to do, exercises, new scenarios to make sure that um, we are prepared, we are able to respond, we have a coordinated effort amongst the various emergency response agencies. We haven't done that type of work. And I wanna say almost a decade just from hearsay and conversations um, because we didn't have that position uh, fully up and running and functional and now we do. Um, and it was very obvious that while we did very well in the last year when we had emergencies come up, um, it would behoove us to always train, always be prepared, always understand um, kind of the chain of command and how things need to flow in the emergency operations center. A Lot of time and energy and hours have gone into dealing with this pandemic and responding to the number of natural emergencies while that goes on. Um, I think this group has done very well and uh, I know there's some great things to come. I don't anticipate, even though we're at that point in COVID, I don't anticipate um, the conversations, the constant changes, um, you know, the flexibility within the executive orders going out and inspecting. I don't see that changing at least for the next 12 months. Um, other changes that you see here in the budget, our uh, tuition reimbursement, which is contractual based recruitments, which include uh, anticipated or potential retirements that are coming up in the next year, using Indeed and other non-free networking tools to increase being competitive, right? We try to find as many um, low cost, no cost opportunities to spread the word that we're looking to hire. 
um, but we're finding that it's very competitive out there to get, uh, engineering was a perfect example of it. Um, you've got to get the word out to different venues because now you're competing in the public and private sector for certain positions and you're really trying to get people in. Um, again, part of that bump that you see in recruitment, pre-employment uh, uh, screening that we have to do, onboarding cost increases, drug testing, um, and um, general other employment hiring costs. Labor relations line item also uh, had a bump. If you look across your um, sheet over multiple years, you see that we've historically budgeted well below the actual. Um, and we also do the same, which isn't here, it's separate budget, but the labor attorney component, we tend to trend lower or, or show a, um, request a lower funding, even though we trend higher than what we see. This year, we're putting it closer to what the actual number is. I'm trying to go for the labor attorney to at least the halfway mark. Um, uh, that's really kind of it for, as I recall, for increases. I'll start it off. Anybody have any questions for Gary? Councilman Biggs? Good evening, Gary. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a question about the recruitment line. So the police pre-employment physicals, is that something separate from what Chief spoke to us uh, last week about as far as his um, 5,000 or plus for the uh, each employee that he's attempting to add on? Is that yeah. is that part of the process, but a separate part of that process? Uh, it is, right? So this is beginning, pre, right? So this is the pre-employment component of it, what he's talking about. Well, depending, I don't have the line item up. In front well, his of thing was the academy that he would have to go right. through. So, That's so the, physicals, the physicals right. is completely separate than the actual process to get in, to proceed in the department. Correct. This okay. is, this is, right. The, the, numbers looks, the numbers look so similar. I wanted to make sure it wasn't, you know, shown in two separate places. Yeah, I, I can assure you, Mike O'Neill would not let me put him in. <laughs> got it. I, um, I trust Mike. I just got to ask the question. Yep, good question. I mean, then uh, another question that um, this might not be a good question, but as far as the human resource manager, I don't know if you caught this or said this earlier, but is there a reason there's a 13,000 deduction from that person's salary? Is that because a new hire, right? Correct. It was okay. we're replacing a previous person who had been here for a number of years. Got it, all right. Worked up I, to that salary. I'm sorry, it was just like, oh, so they agreed to decrease their salaries. <laughs> want to make sure I caught that one as well. Claudia said, cut it as low as I want. So <laughs> that's what I did. All right. HR taking care of our people, right? Yep. Thank you. Those are all the questions I have. I'm sorry. Oh, Deputy Mayor, Tom. <clears throat> A couple questions, uh, Gary, if I could. The, I, I thought I came across it somewhere, but I can't find it. Was the was the emergency operations coordinator positions originally a grant funded position? No, it's it's kind of um, a confusing um, or a misnomer. We receive revenue from the state to address a wide range of things, including emergency management. They kind of calculate a number and say, this is how much we're gonna pay you. Um, but it's, it's, it's a revenue that we receive, it's not necessarily a grant specifically for these positions. And I don't know, Mike, if I did it any justice explaining it that way, but it's a very, um, it's not clear cut as saying you get a grant for X. So a good way to, I think, understand it is if we didn't have these positions and we had a volunteer EOC management staff, we could still find costs in PD and fire that would qualify for the grant. So there's 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 costs you know that for, that far exceed the grants thirteen thousand dollars thereabouts every year and uh, there's all place all sorts of places we can look to find costs that we normally incur every year 
that would satisfy you know requirements it's it's it feels like a perfunctory thing when we when we apply for this every year and um but what we do is is you know we use the most direct directly related costs you know so because we've always funded uh eoc management um you know we've used those those funds first and then my other question was about the uh, uh, labor relations, and I know you you kind of touched on it, but I was it seems to me I, I'm looking at a four year average of the you know from seventeen to twenty, and I and you know, I'm coming up with over fifty thousand dollars yet. We only budgeted twelve thousand last year, and I was wondering what, why it dropped so much and you know we're well over that this year so yeah if, if you look back in the budget books historically and i don't i don't know what the trend was uh but historically that and, and town attorneys seem to be budgeted well below what we spend um you know in any, any given year that can be blown out by depending upon how many union negotiations you do how many arbitrations you have to take care of um you know, as issues come up this year, as an example, we didn't have an HR manager, so we would rely on the labor attorney to provide more guidance than normal. Uh, you know, where um, and I, you know, Claudia would too, but you know, Stephanie was really good at doing a lot of the legwork and then just running it by the town attorney and uh, or the labor attorney and making the adjustment. I tried to do the same, but obviously, I'm not, you know, a 20 year veteran of HR. Um, and you know, again, with the negotiations. I, I, so I don't know the logic of why we went lower. Um, I guess it would, you know, if I consider it similar to police overtime, it's one of those things where if you need an attorney, you're going to pay the attorney. Um, so it, I, you know. I just, um, <clears throat> you know, coming from me, I'm not one to want to spend more money on the budget, but we haven't had any years that it was, uh, you know, 25,000 or less. The lowest was thirty-one thousand. So I'm just wondering if we have enough in there to justify it. You know, that's that's just one of those accounts that we have not funded the right way. Or is kind of an old tradition, right? We kind of we know what to expect there, but for some reason we never bump it up to where it needs to be. I guess we don't want to admit, you know, that we need to spend that much money on attorneys at times. But we did, you know, I we bumped it up from twelve thousand to twenty-five, you know, kind of move it in the right direction. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of it's it's very it's it's you know congruent to police overtime and physical services overtime, where we just kind of say, you know, you put know, a number in there. No, no good. It's uh, it's we're tradition bound on certain accounts for some odd reason. I don't know why, but um, we I'd be more than happy to change that. But <laughs> there always seems to be pressure from somewhere not to. So we, you know. Yeah, I, I, won't, know. I wouldn't fight you either. Good. Yeah, that's all Councilman I had. Biggs. Thanks. Councilman Biggs. Um, thank you, Mayor. To piggyback off of that, um, since we're budgeted for the current year at 12,000, are we already showing a large overage? Yep. Yeah. If you look in the front of the book. Yeah. Um, no, I missed it. Never mind. Additional okay. information tab. Yep. Seventy-four thousand over right now. Got it. Thank you. We're substantially under on town attorney, which is another one of those accounts that we're never under on. So there's a couple of things, and we're working on that for the for your projection is to make sure we've got things sorted correctly between labor relations and town attorney and then to just just get a a fix on the backlog of bills that we need to address so but you'll see we'll get that cleaned up for you in the projection you'll have something accurate to look at right and and again keep in mind right so you're you know you're you're over on one attorney but you're under on staffing because we didn't pay for an hr person for an entire year so it's you know there's there's kind of some wash that takes place in there where does the town attorney show up? Is that central office or something? That's uh, what I was. Separate department. Separate department. Separate own, staff. Own department. 
Yeah, it's right oh. under town manager, I think. If you look on that that uh, summary sheet. Oh yeah, yeah, right. Yep. Next line down. Yeah, so you're seventy, you're almost seventy four under on that one. So so the wash. <clears throat> Although I, I will caution you, and that's where Mike is saying he's coming out. There's there's still outstanding bills. You know, there's yeah, no, I, I realize. If you talk to Cheryl. We're probably only on like February because we obviously don't react until we get the bill, and then there's some processing times. So I think we're a couple months behind there, or at least a month behind. A lot of places just say, "Oh, we never received the bill. That must have got lost in the mail." Can you send yeah, another? The fiscal send year. Another. Send another. <laughs> After July one. Okay. Any other questions for Gary? And now that I lost my tab, bear with me one second. Uh, from and I may have missed it. The seasonal or uh, part-time floater was she in this year? I mean, I, I'm sorry because I didn't really get in as much because the building's been closed. I saw Cheryl shaking her head. Yeah, so we uh, we lost Stephanie in July, and our our uh, floater got uh, family moved to Texas. And so it was just Cheryl and I for the last year uh, making it work. All right, and we plan on hiring, bringing a floater back? Yes, please. Okay. And nobody's paying into pension and you guys are all new. Or you're paying into pension, we're, we're not, you're not part of the plan. Well, uh, no participants in that department. No participants in the uh, defined benefit, correct? I guess that may be a question for later on too. How many more do we have that are still in the defined plan? It's starting yeah. to do. Um, I'm working on pulling that together for you, Mayor. Okay. Yeah, we, and we do that as part of our analysis for each independent, each individual um, union. So we'll pull that, those lists together. Any more questions for Gary on the town manager? Seeing none. We'll go into the meat and bones of the, the budget, the town council. So I believe we kept it relatively flat from last year, slight changes from uh, based off of the cost for professional services and kind of standard billing that we get or invoices that we get, CROG, CCM. Questions? Okay. We're getting to that point where we're starting to feel it. Um, I guess, uh, I don't know if we want to touch on any of Mike's stuff or go with that on Wednesday night. Um, I guess while we have you, Gary and Mike, what will the Board of Ed be discussing on Wednesday night? 
I don't think they, I don't remember them ever coming in. Uh, yeah, they, they, they have in previous years, they kind of touch upon, um, kind of, they don't go through their full budget presentation again. I think the council typically has asked them questions um, specific that they might not have answered previously during their budget hearing or if there's any other things that have come up. Okay. Speaking of things that have come up, uh, the appropriations committee voted out their budget, the legislative budget, which, and I guess this is probably a question for Mike O'Neill, we base our preliminary budget on the governor's proposed budget from Jan February, uh, yeah. January year. Yeah, so we're seeing more money for ECS, right? ECS and the town. I, I don't know if it's MRSA funds, uh, pilot. I don't know what's included, but it's about 170 some odd thousand more on the town side, 600 and some odd thousand more on the ECS uh, side. Yeah, total increase through the appropriations budget versus the governor's budget, approximately 776,000 more. It's a good sign. We'll help the mill rate. We'll take the revenue. Is that something we can work with or we have to wait until it's finalized? In other words, running a scenario? We typically know before adoption. Um, but we would, you know, if we didn't, we'd be talking to CCM. You know, we'd be relying on probably some of you or, or Gary to talk to the delegation to to get a feel for, you know, where the final number is going to be. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't want to get caught short, that's for sure. Right, right. But we wouldn't have to wait until it was actually finalized, right? I mean, a lot of things in our budget are based the, on the right? municipal runs are usually some of the last things that we see, unfortunately. But yeah, the way that they're operating right now, Mike, and what do you? Th I think we should we should know something by the fifteenth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, every person I have talked to is. And I've been stressing, like every other municipal official is stressed to get a budget in place before, for the state to get a budget in place before May 15th. Um, we do, and I'll throw this out there, and definitely have a discussion at a later date. We do have the option through this governor's executive order to still go beyond the May 15th deadline that we have. Um, last year we adopted on the, I think the last day of April um, before, or no, Memorial Day weekend was the weekend before. So it would have been like the last Friday before June 1st um, of last year. So I know both Gary and Mike stressed that they want to have three weeks prior to. July 1 to get all the cards printed up and yeah as much time as we can, can get bills yep okay And would, what would we have to do if we decided to go beyond the May 15th we would have to vote on that on the May 3rd meeting if you want to extend it past May 15th, you have to ha you have to vote to extend it. Yeah, at the third, because our next meeting after that isn't until the 17th. So we'd already missed the deadline. Correct. So we'd have to have it on the agenda for the third. I guess the only reason I'm bringing it up is partly because of the revised numbers coming out of the legislative budget versus the governor's budget. And then kind of keeping close tabs on what CCM is saying for uh, ARP funds. 
we still don't have any direct guidance on how to, to utilize those funds coming in? Nothing yet. I think, what did we discuss? They had 90 days from... It's actually 60. So May 11th, Treasury should, is that's the deadline for Treasury, the U.S. Treasury to... Oh, for Treasury. Deadlines. Which then it presumably would, you know, kind of go through OPM for translation. Okay, and there, are, OPM is simply just the pass through for the funds. Yep. Yep. And what are we expected to receive? In and I guess it's the ARP funds are used. I think we have three years to use them. That sounds correct. Yeah, I can't lay my hands on it, but seven seven million dollars, right, Gary? I think that's combined, right? Yeah. Yeah. BOE. Okay. And we we can't tell the board how to spend that money. We, I mean, is is BOE funds directly from OPM through us to Board of Ed? Similar to how, is that how ECS funding is? We get the ECS funding and we get it to the board? Yes, for, e, I mean, ECS, it, I think it technically comes from State Department of Ed. Um, The stimulus money, I mean, that's something you, you should drill into, I think, on Wednesday with, with Matt and Mike is just understanding what they've gotten to date and um, what else is coming on their side. You know, how much of that, I guess, how much of that plays into the 2.7% increase? You know, is, is some of, did they move cost off of their operating budget? Were they able to do that? And is that something that's coming back the following year? So we don't we don't know any of that. Correct. And any documentation that they may have received clarifying usage or how they calculated the number that they came up with, you know, if they used a formula to make a determination as to how much they were going to receive, it might be good to know how, what the um, what the uh, what the formula was that they used, right? Based off of students student population, age of the buildings, um, you know, energy costs, estimated energy cost increases, that type of uh, uh, related calculation. Maybe if there's some gaps that you guys don't know of that you can write down some questions. You know, I don't want to put you guys on the spot to be, you know, finance director to finance director asking questions, but if there's any holes in what the Board of Ed received for this past stimulus, you know, whatever it would have been, ESSER 1, ESSER 2 funds, whatever may have received last summer. I don't know if that would have been ESSER 1 back then, what it was called. But if there were a couple rounds of stimulus funds that went to the board, Yeah, we can do that. And conversely, did we receive any stimulus money on the town side? We did. We got the, uh, I forget if you call it CARES Act or OPM had another name for it, CF, CRF. CRF, yeah. So but that was 365,000. Uh, I think it was, wasn't it just under, it wasn't like 298? Oh no, we got the and we got the sixty over. It. You're right; it was over two tranches. Tranches. Everything um, but the pizza money. And that, yeah, yeah, they and yoga. <laughs> I think there was a yoga class in there. Oh, um, that's yes. The uh, and, and as part of that, I I may for the council meeting have a request for an allocation of part of that based off of uh, CCHD had some. Um, Central Connecticut Health District has incurred a, a lot of expenses over the last year. Another, uh, some of the other member communities um, in discussion, he's kind of given me a breakdown of additional costs. Um, 
for some consideration in terms of assistance for all the work that added work that they had um, as well. But I'll, I'll describe that more when we get to agenda setting. And we're, right. we're working with the auditors to understand what our options are for treating that money. I mean, barring any other options, it would become, you know, it would be general fund revenue, which means it just comes in and it goes to fund balance. And you can't really, you can't access it without an appropriation in the following year, you know, in the year we're looking at. But if we can set up a special revenue fund, you could work with that money, now, you know, and hold it. You could work with that money now and say that you're going to, you're going to access that money to fund part of the budget next year. You know, just sort of a kind of a distinct, you know, just setting that aside like a grant and, you know, having it in a multi-year fund where you can access it for fiscal 22. So we'll, we're, you know, we're okay. still working on that. Uh, how, does the, how does the school handle, or how does the town handle um, Board of Ed funding that applies to facilities that the town now takes care of? You know? That's if, a good question. You know. That if might. They, they get grant money, but, you know, and it goes directly to them, but yet it maybe could cover increased ventilation or things of that nature. Um, Bruce, Tom, Bruce, everything's a roof. <laughs> I, just, I don't know how it works. I'll put that in the list of questions for you. <laughs> I'm, I don't need, I don't know either, Tom. <laughs> You know, like, I know I'm getting off track, but it, and it's late, but like the cost per student for education, do, do we think somehow figure the physical structures as part of that cost or is it just? Yeah, for the minimum budget requirement? Yeah. So there's a component. So Matt puts a big report together in August that he sends to the State Department of Ed which includes in-kind costs, which is anything that we pay for on our side. So we, oh. put, a, we put a portion of debt service. Um, we used to do crossing guards when they were in the police department, you know, they're not anymore, but things like that. So we, and so we took, when the custodians moved over, we now include all of that in okay. the in-kind reporting that he has to do on his side. But you would think any any of those costs should be fair game for use of grant money. Yeah, I would think. Makes sense. Okay. Anything else while we're at? Definitely some things to uh, consider. Gary and Mike, if you can, you know, jot down some questions, and, you know, maybe some gaps, like I said, where you guys think the board may be able to pull out from any stimulus funds that they've already received, plan to receive. I'm just thinking, you know, listening what seems like days ago, but when Kathy Bagley was on earlier, some of the summer help if we are using any of those funds, I keep reading about the Accelerate CT program and getting the enrichment programs for, for students for the summer. If any of that is coming out of our budget through Parks and Rec and not the Board of Ed, and even the Board of Ed, I mean, can that be used? Can the um, ARP funds be used for that? I guess questions for uh, Wednesday night. Yep. Good. Everybody else is good. Okay. Motion to adjourn.
So moved. Second. Good. Okay. We are adjourned. Claudia, nice meeting you. Thanks for and staying on. I think you need a vote on that one. Oh yeah, I do need a vote on that one. You're always right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. It's too late. I'm always delirious at this point. Eat my dinner. Good. Now I'll say it. Claudia, nice meeting you. Good night. Good night. Yeah, I know. I got a calzone waiting for me. Mike, drive carefully home. Well, I think no. You got the longest commute. I was going to say, what about me? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a ride. Hey, I'll, pick you, I'll pick you up on the way by. Exactly. <laughs> send, the, send the Tesla. <laughs> Take care, guys. Yeah.